John Mashon on a hot and muggy afternoon at Ed Smith Stadium. It's the Orioles getting set to take on their AL East rival, the Tampa Bay Rays. And it's Little League Day here at the ballpark. The kids in a pregame parade around the field at Ed Smith Stadium. And hi, everyone. I'm Jim Hunter. For the Orioles here in Florida, the days are dwindling. Believe it or not, two weeks from tomorrow is opening day in Baltimore. And here's where the O's are as today they conclude the third week of games in Grapefruit League play. One of the keys here, the opportunities of players. 47 different players, 39 different pitchers. You see the games more road uh, than home. That will change over the next couple of weeks. 11 games to go before they pack it up and head north. And my pleasure to welcome to the Masson family former Orioles All-Star Brian Robertson. Brian, at this point in camp, where are the players, or maybe I should say, where should they be at this point in camp? Where they should be and where they are, maybe two totally different things. Where they want to be is Baltimore. They want to be in Camden Yards. You're, you're starting to get that feel of the real thing coming. They can sense that orange carpet running down out of center field. You know, but you look at it from a couple different standpoints. As position players, especially the regulars, guys that are going to be out there every day, now they can begin to get into a rhythm. You've been playing sporadically. Now you're going to play more consistently and deeper into games, six, seven, eight innings, and the at-bats are going to begin to pile up. Where you want to be is that the game starts to slow down. You've had four to six months off from game action. The numbers may not be as important as just slowing the game down, as well as doing things that you haven't done yet, taking an extra base on a base hit, making a defensive play, things like that are things that these guys want to get under their belt. All right, so today it's the Tampa Bay Rays in town. The team has its first and only day off of the spring tomorrow. We're coming back. Lineups and first pitch are next. Before the Cadillac... is brought to you by Sarasota. There's so much to see and do on the beaches and islands of Sarasota on Florida's Gulf Coast. Go beyond the stadium to Siesta Beach, named winner of the 2015 TripAdvisor Traveler's Choice Awards for beaches. Plan now at visitsarasota.org. Well, nice day to be on the beach. It is warm. It is humid. Uh, the sun peeking through the clouds. It rained on the overnight and into the morning, but cleared up perfectly and just in time for batting practice. So the Orioles are taking the field, and Brian Roberts getting hellos from the umpires at home plate as uh, he makes his massive debut. That was nice to see. And the players have taken the field. We're going to head downstairs now and listen into our Star Spangled Banner, performed today by Lane Abernathy. Ladies and gentlemen, we ask that you please rise and gentlemen, remove your caps as we once again welcome singer-songwriter Lane Abernathy, who will honor America with his rendition of the Star Spangled Banner. Oh, say can you see by the 
the dawn's early light, what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming. Whose broad stripes and bright stars Through the perilous fight Over the ramparts we watched Were so gallantly streaming And the rockets regular The bombs bursting in That our flag was still there Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave Over the land of the free And the home of the brave well, nicely done by Lane Abernathy of Bell Buckle, Tennessee. How small is that town? How about 450 people large? He recorded his first album in the same studio where Neil Young uh, recorded his uh, great album, Harvest. Uh, the stories in those songs uh, Lane performed before the game. A real nice concert. Uh, something special about his music and nicely done for the national anthem. Here's a look at the Rays lineup for today. Most of the regulars here, Forsyth, Morrison, and Longoria, having uh, big-time regular season numbers against the O's. Dickerson and Sousa Jr. and Kiermaier with Beckham Loney and Rivera. And Chris Tillman taking the mound today for the Orioles. We have a couple things that we want to keep an eye on today. First one, spin the wheel. Tillman talked to me the other day when I was here about his curveball. It's a, it's a huge key to his success. He works so well off the fastball up, pairing it with that 12-6 uh, curveball. Second one is cut him up. He's also trying to perfect the cutter slash slider. It's something that's going to open up the inside part of the plate for a le on the left-handed hitters and have something moving away from the righties that will open up the fastball in for him. And Hipster, yes, he's from California, but that's not the kind of hip we're talking about, Jim. We're talking about that hip injury that he had and, and missed some time early in the spring. The legs are such a key to guys on the mound and their success, and I believe that if Chris Tillman is healthy and those legs are strong, that we can look for a really, really solid bounce back 2016 from Chris Tillman. Now, this is just his second A-game appearance of the spring. He worked last Tuesday against Toronto, so both of his starts uh, to this point, including today, against division opponents. Now, sometimes managers will hide their pitchers against division opponents. Buck has the opposite approach this year. He wants them to face the better hitters. Yeah, you know, I was talking to Buck the other day about it, and, and I always felt the same way. I, I don't see why, especially a guy like Tillman, who's been around for four, five, six years now, it, it's no secret to the guys in the division what he has. Uh, so I like the fact that he's going out on the big mound in front of the crowd and facing guys that he's going to face during the regular season. I think that's important. It was important for me as a hitter to get out there and see the same guys that I see during the season. Well, Tillman last Tuesday road game, so he does own gray pants. Not all of the regulars do. That was at the Dunedin Tuesday. Faced 12 batters, lasted an inning and two thirds, and allowed two runs on five base hits. It is a muggy, muggy afternoon here, so we'll see if that has any effect on Chris. And there is Logan Forsythe, who has settled in very nicely with this race team. Now 29 years old and having a big time spring. You see that batting average at 478 for Forsythe. And that ball one and we're underway. There's uh, Tillman last year, Brian, 11 and 11, and the ERA up to 4.99. Yeah, it was it was definitely an awkward year for Chris. You know, we're, we're used to the Chris Tillman that we saw in 12, 13, and 14, and that's what we're hoping he'll get back to for sure. Uh, you know, numbers of 38 and 16 during that time span. So he's really got to uh, get the curveball going, the cutter, uh, and really kind of get comfortable again. Well, it's good to have reference points, and he certainly has one from a year ago. As he had put together back-to-back -back outstanding seasons. There's a soft line drive, and stop! We'll leap and grab, and one away. And uh, here's what we're talking about, Brian. Last year with Chris Tillman, all of these career highs. 
Yeah, you see the ERA is much higher than it has been at 499. I think the, the number that sticks out to me is he's not striking guys out at the same rate that he was. 6.2, giving up more hits, uh, and obviously not getting nearly as deep into games with, with eight games of uh, more than five runs and nine games of fewer than five innings pitch. We, you know, everyone became very accustomed to Tillman getting deep into games and not giving up a lot of runs. So uh, you're looking to see that explosive fastball again to try and get some more swings and misses. There's Logan Morrison, new to the Rays this year. He's DHing today, and he gets in the one to right field. That'll chase Trumbo, and it's over his head and bounces out of here for a ground rule double. That ball was tagged, and Morrison going after the first pitch, and he didn't miss it. Yeah, you get that sometimes in spring training, the ambush. You're looking at the defense right here for the Orioles. Obviously, last year, a phenomenal year defensively. You got Kim in left field, the gold glover Jones in center, Trumbo, uh, who's looked very comfortable in right. Manny Machado, the gold glover at third. J.J. Hardy at short. Jonathan Scope looking to get those two guys healthy and playing a lot of games this year. Chris Davis, the new sign at first. Caleb Joseph behind the plate with Matt Wieters injured. And then Chris Tillman on the rubber. Well, an RBI chance for Evan Longoria, who's in the number three spot. And again, first ball swinging, but late on the swing. Good velocity at 94 from Tillman early in the game. Longoria, believe it or not, now 30 years old and in his ninth season. Seems like he's been around forever. <laughs> when you, when you sign about so a young year deal and when you have yeah. never even been in the big leagues, it goes by fast. He's off to a slow start in the spring, but that's okay. And a close play at second base. This will be a very long and emotional day for the Tampa Bay Rays. They traveled here from Port Charlotte, which is about 50 minutes, I guess, south of here. After the game today, they are going to St. Petersburg to Tropicana Field, and then tonight they fly to Cuba. Yeah, I was out on the field during batting practice talking to a lot of their guys. They're very excited about the trip. They're going to experience some pretty neat things down there with President Obama as well, and uh, they're going to open the stadium up to about 55,000 invites, they said. Uh, so it's going to be a neat experience for them and great to see baseball going back down to Cuba. You know, it certainly was uh, an amazing scene when the Orioles played there in 1999. Uh, broadcasting that game on the Orioles radio network. Uh, there was so much uh, nostalgia there with the Cuban people who absolutely love baseball. 0-2 on Longoria with a runner at second and one down. And a broken bat bouncer foul down the line. Of course, with Tillman, we talk about reference points. And you look at 2014. He won 13 games, ERA 3.34, and had 34 starts. 2013, he won 16 games and had a 3.71 ERA. So he knows how to get it done. It's just a matter of finding that form. This isn't as if you have a question mark out there. You have a proven winner in the big leagues. No, you do, definitely. And, and what we don't know, what nobody knows going into this, was last year a fluke. Or, or are we hopefully not seeing regression from Chris Tillman? We know that he's capable of going out and what he, doing what he did in 12, 13, and 14. So uh, it's just a matter of getting on the mound and being healthy, I think, for Chris. Well, Tillman uh, now in his eighth season out of Fountain Valley, California, now owns a home right here in Sarasota. You see your neighbor? We are. We live about a mile from each other. So uh, he passed my house on his boat the other day. So. <laughs> <laughs> hey, B-Rob, how you doing up there? <laughs> uh, down in the way and he doesn't chase. Now, those are the kind of pitches that the pitchers really rely on to get chase swings and misses, but Longoria picked up the spin and let it bounce outside. It's what we were talking about earlier. I really like the pitch from Chris Tillman, but it's one of those that he's not getting swings and misses on yet. Uh, and he talked about getting that rotation of the breaking ball and really feeling it and maybe getting it just a little bit crisper. Off-speed pitch. Looked like a changeup. Manny looks the runner back. And Longoria retired two away, so a really good job there by Tillman to get Longoria. Well, here's what we're talking about with Tillman, about regaining consistency. And we went back to 2012 when he became a full-time starter. Last year, in eight of his starts, he allowed five or more runs and less than five innings pitched nine times. And those are key. Obviously, less than five innings, you're not effective. And if you're allowing five or more runs, very tough to win. Uh, and you see the percentages. Uh, the difference is dramatic when you look at 13 and 14 versus 15 and the percentages of, of getting deep into games, less than five inning pitches, which uh, you really need, especially as Chris was supposed to be one of the top of the line, top of the rotation guys. You can't have that many starts of five innings or less to kill your bullpen uh, for the rest of the week. Well, Corey Dickerson now, also new to the race. They picked him up in a trade with Colorado. And he'll take ball one. 
So there's a breaking ball on the first pitch of an at-bat. Yeah, I think that's what we were talking about as well. You're going to start to see these starting pitchers. Buck has made it very clear that there are spots in the rotation that are not solidified. And there's only so long that you can keep going saying, I'm healthy and I'm working on things. you got to see results at some point. And I think you're going to see Chris pitch that way today. You see a first pitch change up and then a really well-located fastball uh, on a 1-0 pitch there. So I think we need to start seeing some results from some of these guys, and that's what they're going to uh, uh, try to do. In his last start, Kevin Gosman had that similar approach. Unfortunately for Kevin, uh, he was diagnosed today with right shoulder tendonitis, received the cortisone shot, so he's going to be shut down for about three days. Yeah, that's never good news when you get a cortisone shot in the shoulder, but we'll hope for the best with uh, with Gauze. Of course, uh, Buck Showalter has not yet set his rotation. We still don't know the eventual starting five, and we don't know what order. Uh, he told reporters yesterday that next Sunday, that'll probably be the day where they set the rotation for the regular season, at least for the first week. And if you pick up a calendar and do the math, by Chris Tillman starting today, he lines up exactly for the home opener on April 4th. I think one thing we know for sure, Buck has a lot of things in his head that probably aren't coming out yet. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Uh, and there's no mistakes, and there's not a whole lot of accidents in Buck Showalter's world. So uh, he's got some things on his mind, and, and you'll start to see it play out. A one and two the count on Corey Dickerson. Strike three called as a Little thought about it. Didn't like it, then he thought he liked it, and he brings him up. So one out, double one left, left to the bottom of the first. Tampa Bay doesn't score, and here come the O's. Well, one out double for the Rays in the first, but Chris Tillman gets out of it, so a man left. Let's get a look at the Orioles lineup for today. Machado, Alvarez, and Adam Jones, who has enjoyed hitting uh, in particular at the drop. 17 career home runs against the Rays. Davis, Trumbo, and Kim with Hardy at short, then Scope and Caleb Joseph. And on the mound for the Riz, Jan Mariñez. Uh, you got a 27-year-old righty from the Dominican Republic. Got a big arm, a guy that can get 94, 97 with a hard slider, looking to duplicate his success last year from AAA in 45 games, a 1.92 ERA. And finally, traded for a manager, Jim. Yep. Not too many guys had the distinction of saying they were traded for a manager, but he was in the trade with uh, Ozzie Guillen from the White Sox to the Marlins. I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but um, it's something that's certainly unique. Kiermaier has to play it on a hop, so Maddie's surging back here in the spring continues as he's on with the leadoff single. And we look uh, at the defense for the Rays in left field. you got Corey Dickerson, the new addition. Kevin Kiermaier, a phenomenal center fielder. Steven Souza Jr., Evan Longoria, the veteran at third base. Tim Beckham, uh, Logan Forsythe at second base. James Loney at first. Rene Rivera behind the plate. And Jan Mariñez on the mound. Here's Pedro Alvarez. You see two for 17. He joined the O's late playing in his sixth game. And when you look at this lineup today, as Alvarez takes down and in, 
this could be what you might see on opening day. Unless Matt Wieters makes his way back and Caleb doesn't get the start. I think you're seeing some similarities. I do think that Buck has uh, Pedro up this high in the order still just to continue to try and get him some quick at-bats and um, having missed a little bit of early spring training. But I think it could be very similar. And a strike of the knees, one and one. The good news about Matt Wieters, uh, I talked to him yesterday morning and he said everything is coming along. Then he went out on the backfield and Mike Bordick threw batting practice to him and Bordy told us before he was just crushing the ball. Today, Matt took BP on the field in the regular turn. He was in the catcher's group. And then he went out and played catch, 25 throws, and he stretched it out to 60 feet. So that's the first time that he's thrown the ball since uh, the elbow came down sore, and uh, he's doing well. Very good news. Uh, I talked to Matt on the field earlier today, as you said, while they were taking batting practice. Says he feels really good swinging the bat uh, 60 feet. I know he's anxious. It's, it's never fun to sit over there and have to watch and, and go through the rehab process, but I think he's going to be back sooner than later. Alvarez to shallow left. There's Corey Dickerson out there in this high sky. Looked like he lost it momentarily. And back to first will go Machado. That's uh, the one thing down here that we have seen consistently is the outfielders having a difficult time seeing the ball off the bat. It is tough to see in spring training. It is so different. You look at that sky right there. That ball can get lost so quickly up in those clouds in that high sky. Uh, I've seen many an outfielder get hit in the head in spring training, unfortunately. And here's one of the best, Adam Jones, and even he says he's got to really concentrate down here. If Adam says that, you know it's tough. Adam's having a real good spring. He is in his 10th game, and check swing, and he went too far. John Hirschbeck over there at first base. It's good to see Adam swinging the bat the way that he is so far this spring, especially with the power numbers. Three home runs already. He looks great. Says he feels great. I think he's motivated coming off of last year. Maybe uh, one of his down, more of a down year than he's had in the past. So I think he's very motivated. Chopper, this is going to be a tough play. Longoria cuts in front to get Jones and moving to second base is Machado. Got him out in front. Yeah, we're starting to see some of that uh, big arm that we talked about early on. You got 94 and 97 with the slider. Here comes Longoria. Uh, perennial gold club option at third base makes it look very easy over there. He's been doing it for a long time Well, Mourinho's has had a lot of experience I mean, uh, this young man. He's been at pro ball since 2006 How about 306 minor league games over 10 years? <laughs> That's a lot of games to be in in the minor leagues and only had a little cup of coffee with the Marlins and the White Sox uh, had a tremendous year last year in AAA. If he can duplicate that, I really believe you'll see him back in the big leagues at some point this year. He has been in the Marlins organization and the White Sox. As Brian said, he was acquired in the trade when Ozzie Guillen went to manage the Marlins. Then he was in Detroit. Then he had a year with the Dodgers and now with Tampa Bay. The one thing why he keeps getting work is that arm. You, you can't teach velocity. You can teach the other stuff. You can tinker with it, but... If you've got a power arm, organizations will always try to give you a shot. Yeah, you can't teach 95. Uh, <laughs> right. and he had some problems with his command, I know, early on in his career, and he seems to have begun to get some of that figured out. If you can figure the command out with that kind of velocity, you've got a pretty good chance to succeed. And a swing and a miss, another off-speed pitch. So you're looking 95, and then you get that. Uh, yeah, that's that good hard slider, which is a, a left-hander's night left-hand hitter's nightmare that back foot slider That's really hard to pick up. You see the tight spin on that one right there So Chris one and two Check swing and he did check Chad Fairchild down at third base Chris is trying to find that timing and uh, it, it's so difficult as Brian pointed out that the regulars don't make very many road trips and uh, the Orioles have had more games on the road than they have at home he homered in his very first spring at bat right here at Ed Smith Stadium and has not homered since as we talked about in the opener you know it's really trying to slow the game down again and the game can get going very fast in spring training sometimes when you when you're playing every other day and you're not getting those regular at bats uh, good job there by Chris
Chris to foul off a, a tough 94 mile an hour fastball on the outside corner. So, you know, it's, it's starting to recognize pitches a little bit better, starting to feel a little bit more comfortable in the box. I'm certainly not too worried that, uh, that Chris isn't going to hit any more homers the rest of the year. And last week there was a road game. He wasn't scheduled to go. He walked in the Bucks' office and said, I want to play. I need at bats. And off he went with his great bats. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you feel that way as a player. You just need to go play. Check swing again. And he checked in time. So the first one he chased, but the last two he's recognized and laid off. Making adjustments. That's what the biggest part of this game is being able to make those adjustments, knowing that you swung at the first one that wasn't a strike, picking up the ball earlier the next couple times, being able to hold your swing and get into this 3-2 count where you might get a pitch to drive. So Matty's not forced, so he'll stay at second base with two men down. And he fouls it off to stay alive guessing he might want that one back. That was the slider that was left up a little bit. The other ones were pretty good down in the zone. Uh, that's the one that I think as he gets going and he gets more into a rhythm, I, he doesn't miss that one too often. Well, this will be the eighth pitch in this at-bat. Mourinho is making his fifth appearance and first start of the spring for the Rays. And Matty took off and a balk has been called. So Manny bothered Mourinho's, and Mourinho's was in his set and then tried to step off, so there's a ball. Well, this is one of those things that you see now with the shifts. You had Longoria over playing shortstop. There's nobody at third base. It is just a foot race between Longoria and Machado, and, and Evan says, well, I can't beat him there, so just go ahead. So a chance for a two-out RBI. And he bounced it past the catcher. And now they're going to say, nope, there was a hit by pitch, so Matty's going to have to go back to third base. The ball bounced and hit Davis, which cost the Orioles a run. Birds have two on with two down. He kept trying to feed Chris that steady di diet of sliders uh, those last three or four pitches, and finally couldn't get it over this time, bounced it off of Chris's leg. Cost the Orioles a run, as you said, but we got yeah, first and third now, and maybe get something going with Trumbo. Yeah, you see it hit right off his knee, and he didn't even phase him. <laughs> Hey, what though? He, he's going to be happy with that at bat, in particular the pitches he laid off. Well, I, I think part of a big part of spring training is you want to see as many pitches as you can. You really do. It's not about results for a guy like uh, Chris at this point. You know, I know early in spring training I would take as many pitches as I could. I might strike out more than I did because I'm hitting him uh, in deeper counts and I'm behind in the count. But you want to see those breaking balls. You want to see those different looks. Our Trumbo now, first and third and two down. And yeah, there's a strike, and the Trumbo's eye is coming on. Mike, look at the, the turnaround the last couple of games. Yeah, and this is what we, we have been talking about, of getting into that rhythm. You know, the first 10 games you're playing every other day, you can't really get into a rhythm, as well as the fact that he's coming to a new team, a new organization. He's trying to get settled in. There's some uncomfortableness involved in that and getting to know people and maybe trying a little too hard, starting to get comfortable and swinging the bat well now. You know, the one thing about Mark, he, he's a very personable guy, and he really is fitting him well in the clubhouse. And it may not be a coincidence that he is in the batting practice group every day with Adam Jones. Adam keeps it loose, and uh, he has welcomed Trumbo to this team. No, I think Jones is definitely the, the right person to um, make someone feel comfortable uh, to break them into the organization, to break them into a group. You know, he's loose, he's fun, he has a great time, and I think it's, I don't, I don't think that was a, uh, a fluke by any means. You know, as we talk about, Buck, Buck doesn't have a whole lot of uh, accidents out there, so I think that was meant to be. And soon, Sue Kim, who's on deck, he's also in Adam's batting practice group. <laughs> That's probably not a, a fluke as well. So again, Arenas ahead, one and two. Strike three called on the outside corner. Trumbo didn't like the call, and he's rung up, so the Orioles strand two. We'll head to the second. We're in Sarasota. No score.
Well, no score as we go to the top of the second, and let's head down to the Orioles dugout and welcome in third base coach and infield coach Bobby Dickerson. And Bobby, if you if you need a backup, I got one up here, an All Star sitting next to me, Brian Roberts. Absolutely, you know that it was, it was a pleasure working with Brian, and it's nice to have him back. Hey, Bobby, we had a great time as always. And uh, you have a blast out there, and it's fun to work with you. We just saw a play right there in the last half inning that we've talked about a lot, and that is shift defense that's been going on over the last few years. You saw a perfect example of how people can get caught out of position uh, with Evan Longoria at shortstop and Manny Machado on second base and basically just walks to third base. You guys have talked a lot about this. Can you explain kind of some of the things that you guys are working on? Yeah, that's the whole key to shift defense is having a little awareness. Look at Jonathan's looking for me right now. <laughs> right here. I'm over here. You're good. All right. There you go. He's looking to see if he's all right. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, you know, it's, it's telling the guys, making sure one thing is being in the X spot. Okay, we want to play this guy here, but it's it's also understanding what's going on in the in the pitch sequence and all the alertness and and being aware of what's going on on the field and and like that situation. I mean, I was trying to get Manny's attention to pitch before that, and that's a valuable base. As you saw, if it doesn't hit Chris, we get a run there. Sure, exactly. Uh, you know, 90 feet's important at any time, and, and I know. Uh, as this has evolved and as this has developed, you have to do totally different things with a right-handed hitter versus a left-handed hitter. You have a third baseman in a different position, a shortstop. Uh, I know at times you guys have tinkered even with putting Manny out in right field as a as your second base option. What have you found to be kind of the biggest issue with the shift, and, and what do you really have to stay on the guys about? You know, it's the what-ifs. It's the, you know, okay, we're in a shift, and we make an error in the shift. Now what happens? Where does everybody go? Making sure we're not out of position and, to, like you said, give up that extra 90 feet. Um, we're in a shift, and they hit a double. You know, just knowing all the responsibilities, like, there, there we go right there. It's a good example. Prime example. Perfect example. Jonathan's playing on the other side. We get a pop-up to his normal position, and, and he has to slide over. Everything goes right back to the normal uh, responsibilities. But it's just making sure that um, we're prepared for anything that could happen. Um, other than what we're wanting to happen. You know, when we play in the shift, we're expecting him to hit a ground ball into us, and if something happens uh, against that, we want to be prepared for that. When you employ the shift, and obviously there, there's a lot of trends that you follow or you wouldn't go in the shift to begin with, do the pitchers have to follow a certain game plan, or do they still pitch their game and you decide where's the best chance that they're going to hit the ball? You know, all those things come into, uh, come into play. We look at video and we look at, at players' uh, history against that certain pitcher. We look at their tendencies of what they've done. And we found through, through a lot of the um, information we get, hitters are hitters. They, they, if they hit right-handed uh, pitchers a certain way, that's how they hit them. I mean, it, uh, velocity guys are non-velocity guys. We try to, try to take into account the velocity may be pushed the other way a little bit. But, but all the information doesn't show that. It, it, you know, guys usually hit the ball. Um, for example, Chris Davis is a pull hitter and, and on the ground. He's a pull guy on the ground. And no matter if it's velocity or no velocity, he gets the head out, you know. So um, we, we try to take as much information as we can. And, and, again, it's not an exact science. It is an art out here. And we try to do our best and get in the position to, to get most of the ground balls. Yeah, it's not as easy as people think to just slap one the other way when you're when you're being shifted, that's for sure. But uh, I, I also, going into spring training, I think everybody has an eye on certain guys of how is this guy going to come in compared to last year. Can you tell us maybe somebody that you've been most excited to see the way that they've uh, come into spring training, the way they've performed? Well, you know, looking at how J.J. battled through injuries last year, J.J. Hardy, that is, he, he's... He's just been incredible all springs. He's in great shape. Um, he's he's not feeling um, any soreness, any injury. You know, he, he battled that left shoulder all year last year after that dive right towards the end of spring training, and um, he, he's he's on a mission. And, and right now, um, in my opinion, right now where we are with him, he, he's ahead of schedule as as far as. Um, what I was hoping to see, and he's, he's really exciting. Hey, Bobby, one thing I've noticed uh, in the three weeks of games down here is how Jonathan Scope is very much at ease. Is, is that simply a result of experience? Yeah, you know, he's got a great support cast. I mean, when you look over to your right, and there's J.J. Harding, there's Chris Davis to your left, and across the field there's a platinum glove winner in front of you and, and who's your best friend. Um, it puts him in a place where he can he can be the fourth infielder in this group and, and be comfortable. And, you know, speaking of Jonathan, one of the things we really want to do with Jonathan this year is, is try to get him to, to work on his crossover and, and show a little more range. And, you know, he's such a monster out there on the field. He's, it, it's a little more difficult for him than it, it is a scat back, you know, but he's, um, he's 
definitely feeling right at home, especially with all those guys around him. All right, well, Brian is hoping he can uh, hit him some fungos later. You know, a couple of ground balls at second base. Uh, are you up for that? Absolutely. It was a pleasure. <laughs> I, I tell you, we miss him all the time. All right, well, Bobby, thanks so much. A great camp for the infield so far, and we know it will extend to the season. This may be the best fielding defensive infield in the American League. We appreciate the visit. Thanks very much for having me. Uh, this Bobby Dickerson down by the bench, and there's a real good inning for Chris Tillman. He gets a couple of strikeouts, including that breaking ball that freezes Beckham. Three and three down, mid-second, no score. It's already been a, a great day here at Ed Smith Stadium. The uh, pregame concert late Abernathy. The Clydesdales outside. The, my favorite part about that is the fire engine dog. I you love know, the Clydesdales. We, we saw them down by our house the other day. And it was uh, it was very exciting. Well, great, great Kim with a base that. hit as he continues to come on. Good piece of hitting. He's been swinging a hot bat, starting to get more and more comfortable uh, at the plate, and I think in his surroundings, and maybe even more than anything. So Kim now with seven base hits on the spring. And he went after the first pitch, so that gets J.J. Hardy up. J.J. is having an outstanding spring. 375. He's played in nine games. He's got nine hits. I like the average. <laughs> I, I like to see him healthy. I like to see him playing so often and swinging them by well. Uh, you know, this is a guy who can, who can add so much to this team when he's healthy, and I think he is this year. Why is it so important, and you were a switch hitter, so your front shoulder was opposite side depending on the day, but last year it was his left shoulder that was ailing, and he said it really affected him batting. Well, why is it for a right-handed batter the lead shoulder so important? Yeah, well, the, the lead hand is your should be your dominant hand when you're hitting, so you want to be dragging the knob of that bat through with that bottom hand. You, do, you try to keep the top hand out of it as much as possible. Uh, and so when you when that left shoulder, that front shoulder for a right-handed hitter is weak or hurting, you can't pull that through with the kind of force and the amount of strength that you need to. And it really just saps your power, it saps your bat speed, and I think we kind of saw that with J.J. last year. Well, the one thing he has been doing consistently here in Sarasota is hitting the ball with authority. He's got a triple already, he's got a double. Still looking for his first home run. Strike three called on the corner, so Reynes pinpoint command on that pitch, a second strikeout. Well, we've seen the good fastball. We've seen the live fastball with a lot of tailing action and a lot of late life. And we talked about the command issues that he had at some points in his career. He hasn't seemed to have shown that today. Uh, you see one painted on the black right there. There's not a whole lot you can do if you're J.J. Hardy with that one. Here's Jonathan Scope. It was having uh, overall maybe the best spring, although Ryan Flaherty might argue that. 
First ball swinging and a high fly ball to right. Sousa Jr. near the line. And he's got it for the out. So back to first goes Kim and two men down. So both Scope and Kim first ball swinging. Another capacity crowd here at Ed Smith Stadium as the Orioles continue to draw well. This is a great place to come watch a ball game, especially on a day like this. They have done such a good job uh, of renovating this complex and this stadium, and fans love it, players love it. Uh, it's just a really good atmosphere for families to bring their kids to. Here's Caleb Joseph with Kim at first and two down. Well, it's also become a, a tremendous partnership between the Orioles as an organization and Sarasota as a community. Seventh year here in Sarasota, and the Orioles generate each spring or over the course of the year, including the spring, $81 million into this community. Oh, well, they, they're so entrenched now. You know, I, I was able to be a part of a initiative this offseason, actually, uh, where they're in the Sarasota school system now trying to incorporate healthy eating and activity levels and things like that. So it really is a great partnership. It, it's not one-sided by any means. The, right. the people of Sarasota love the Orioles, and the Orioles are giving back, and that's the way it should. That's the way it works best. Uh, Caleb down in the count 0 and 2 and down and away wouldn't chase. Well, so this Saturday, there's going to be a concert here Saturday night, a charitable event after the day game. The YMCA is going to benefit. So it's, it's just a, a really great partnership. Of course, the Orioles, as an organization, do tremendous charitable work. The Orioles Foundation is always looking to help. I think it's something that uh, definitely gets put in the background. People may don't, uh, maybe don't hear about as much as they should. And, and so uh, it's great for people to understand how much the, the players, the team ownership is out in the community wanting to be a part of making the community better, not just here in Sarasota, but certainly in Baltimore as well. Two and two on Caleb, who's making Mourinho's work. And inside, so from 0-2 to a full count. Caleb having a good at bat here, and certainly with uh, the health situation of Matt Weeders, you don't know how much playing time Caleb's going to get early on. So these are good at bats for Caleb to get get deep in the count, uh, working back from 0-2 in a hole, and see if he can get something he can hit here with the 3-2 count. So Kim gets a head start. And he fouls off the inside pitch, bounces up into the crowd and back on the field. Look like a ricochet near the race dugout as well. Well, even though the majority of the 25-man roster is likely already set, there are still jobs to be won here. There's uh, left field, although Kim is coming on now, as they hoped he would. There are two bullpen spots, and there's the matter of the rotation. And there's a base hit up the middle for Caleb Joseph, and Kim's going to make the turn to go to third. Kiermaier thought about it, but he'll get it in the second base. Caleb's going to be real happy with that at bat. 0 2, works it full, and a two out single. Terrific at bat there by Caleb Joseph. You get to 3 and 2, you, you foul off a slider, and then you get a fastball up in the zone. This is a tough pitch to get on top of, and Caleb does it very well. He stays on top, drives it up the middle. Uh, and, and in the opening, this is another thing that we talked about with the position players. You've got Kim being able to now take an extra base uh, going from first to third and trying to stretch things out and get your body going, get it ready to be um, to be in midseason form on opening day. You have to be able to do those things. Well, here's Manny with the RBI opportunity. Singled his first at bat. And the breaking ball for a strike. Not looking for that on the first pitch. Not sure you necessarily agreed with the call either. <laughs> uh, once a hitter, always a hitter. <laughs> They're playing him the pull on the infield, straight away in the outfield. He lays off the off-speed pitch outside. You watch Manny hit, and it's so fun to watch. I spent many days in the batting cage. Uh, just watching him hit off the tee, watching his approach, he's so quiet, so calm with his lower half, and he stays through the ball and up the middle as well as any young player I've ever seen, which allows him normally to lay off of the hard slider. Not so much on that one, but it does allow him to see the ball longer, protect against those sorts of pitches, and, and, and this is a kid who is just at the tip of the iceberg of what he's able to do. And it looks like he'll likely bat leadoff again because there really aren't that many other options. 
plus Joey Rickard makes the club and gets a start here or there. But last year, of course, Manny, he led the major leagues with 713 plate appearances. That is a lot of at-bats. And uh, played 162 games, something to be extremely proud of, especially coming off of uh, the injuries that he came off of the year before to bounce back and to play in all 162 games, have that many plate appearances, and do what he did on the field was really uh, phenomenal to watch. Just outside ball three. Well, of course, Buck Showalter is always tinkering with lineups, especially down here. And uh, he has uh, told the reporters who cover the team day in and day out that, you know, the computer tells you, put your best hitter in the leadoff spot because then he'll get more at-bats. Well, certainly played out with Matty last year. Yeah, I, I don't have a problem with it whatsoever. You know, you, people say, well, you're wasting 30, 35 home runs. Well, you're not wasting them if nobody's on in front of you. So you got to have somebody on in front of you in order for it to matter. Um, I'll take him wherever I can get him. Another great at bat by Manny. We talked about the quiet approach. He swung at one bad slider and then laid off two more after that because he is so quiet and able to pick up the ball. Now that at bat, Scott Kubal will be very, very happy with that. That is what they're working on down here to a man: pitch recognition. Uh, Kubal wants you to go after your pitch, but he wants you to go after a good hitter's pitch and try not to chase. And Manny, except for the one swing and miss on the slider, did exactly that in that at-bat. And I did talk to uh, Kubal about that on the field the other day. And, and you can't go up there looking to take and looking to walk. Guys' stuff is so good. People are throwing so hard now. Alvarez to the gap in left center field. That ball's hit a long way. And that is gone! It carried out for a grand slam. What a laser beam for Pedro Alvarez. And just like that, it is 4-0 O's. Gotta love the grand slams in spring training. What a great swing by Pedro Alvarez. You take the, you look at the at-bats that led up to that. Caleb Joseph getting on top of a 3-2 fastball for a single. Manny Machado laying off some tough sliders. You get, you just pass the baton. And when you're looking at this lineup, when you're talking about the kind of thunder that's in this lineup, all you have to do is keep the train moving and somebody's gonna hurt you. And we saw it right there. So that'll be it for Mourinho's as he is lifted mentioned this is likely to be a bullpen day and this was a laser shot pedro more known as a pull guy but you see him stay on this sinker middle down away and drive it out to left center there are some big strong guys on this team and you're going to see a lot of these swings uh throughout the course of this season so pitching change in sarasota four nothing goes on the alvarez grand slam Well, Pedro Alvarez with a grand slam, his first home run of the spring. He now has six RBIs playing in his sixth game. And here is Kyle McPherson, Adam Jones' first ball swinging and a chopper to third. Longoria guns across low, scooped out nicely by Loney. And on one pitch, McPherson ends the inning. But a productive inning for the O's as Alvarez goes deep in a 4-0 Orioles lead.
Well, the regular season is almost here, and the time to get on board is right now. Become an Orioles full or partial season plan member, and you'll start enjoying the exclusive orange carpet benefits, including huge savings over the cost of single-game tickets, postseason ticket priority, MLB's most flexible exchange policy, and access to the hottest ticket in Birdland, which, of course, is Orioles opening day. For all the details, Orioles.com slash season. Get online and get involved today. Chris Tillman, a very efficient first two innings. No runs on um, just one base hit and 27 pitches to get through a couple of innings. So pitch efficiency. And this is third spring start and just his second in an A game. He faced uh, some pirate minor leaguers on one of the backfields late last week before pitching Tuesday against Toronto. Yeah, he's looked very sharp today. I really liked what I saw in the second inning. The strikeout to Kiermaier, the strikeout to Beckham. Used the cutter on the lefty Kiermaier for a strikeout. The big curveball that we've been looking for to Beckham to punch him out. Looking, uh, Those are the things that we're looking for with from Chris Tillman. Well, James Loney gets one out over the plate and a leadoff single. Fell behind there at 1-0. Had to come back with a fastball. Left it over the middle of the plate. Loney, a veteran hitter, very good Hitter knew what to do with it, stayed on it, drove it up the middle for a single. Tillman last year still won 11 games, even though the uh, inconsistencies plagued this season. It is very difficult for starting pitchers. The, the wins, they really have so little control over. You know, you look at Chris Archer on Tampa Bay, who's one of the best pitchers in the major leagues. He had a losing record last year because they never score for him. Yeah, it is one of those uh, stats that can be very misleading at times. You know, you see um, even a guy like uh, Hutchinson up in Toronto who had really bad numbers, really, but won a lot of games, all things considered. So uh, you're looking more for getting deep into games, giving yourself, giving your team a chance to win, certainly, and, you, and the wins are a plus, but uh, the win-loss thing can be very uh, deceiving at times. Every year in a major league rotation, there's going to be one starter, who gets a ton of support and there's going to be one who gets none and it doesn't even carry over from year to year there's no rhyme or reason why it happens there might be five starters that get a lot of support on this team this yeah, year yeah I, <laughs> so, I tend to agree with that. Uh, you know but yes in general i think you're right you know usually one guy gets the benefit of the doubt one guy uh, just has no luck whatsoever when it comes to his team scoring runs while he's on the mound well, two and one on Rene rivera the number nine batter with loney on at first an easy play for Adam Jones. Glides back to it. And out one away. Well, of course, it, it all starts with the rotation. And, Mike, here's the difference between a playoff year and an 81 and 81. The starters last year, 51 wins and a high ERA. 14th in the American League, in fact, in ERA. But look back to 2014, 3.61 and 68 wins out of the starters. So that's what it's all about on this team. And I like how you just worded that. Give us a chance that we're going to score enough to win a game. Yeah, you see right there, that's a dramatic difference. You're talking almost a, a run uh, difference in your ERA from 2014 to 2015. So you don't have to be that much better, just maybe half a run better than you were last year. And this team will make the playoffs, I believe, because they will score so many runs. So it's just about being good enough, really, on a lot of days as a starting pitcher. And the other aspect of that is, and we talk about for the rotation to keep the team in games. With leads late in games, you have one of the best bullpens in the American League waiting to come in and get those final outs. As we know, many teams nowadays, this is how they're building their teams. And starting with the Kansas City Royals several years ago, teams are going to the fact that if our starters can get us through six, we're going to just fill up the back end of our bullpen so that we don't lose those games. You see it pop up down the right first baseline. CD goes over to the wall and makes a grab. But that's how teams are building now is just to get to the sixth inning and we'll shut them down the seventh, eighth, and ninth. You know, we talked quite a bit about the Orioles rotation and last year of the 162 starts, they had just 47. So not even a third, 54 games being a third of the season, 47 of at least seven innings. But there's two reasons for that. And one is the manager. If Buck Showalter has two outs to get in the seventh and he likes the reliever matchup versus the starter a third time through the lineup he'll make the change well this is the difference in the game from 15 20 years ago is that everyone matches up now starting in 
you know, sometimes the sixth, but certainly in the seventh, for sure. You just don't see very many pitchers unless they're a frontline number one bona fide starter get through seven, eight innings anymore because uh, by the time you get through the lineup three times, they want a reliever. They feel like you have a better chance of succeeding with a new reliever than a starter facing that lineup for the fourth time. Strike one to Morrison, who didn't like the call. Well, on this team, maybe we should look at it like not get through seven innings, get us to the seventh inning. Uh, because I the think so. The matchups are just so, so much more favorable. You know, where you have uh, Brad Brock and get out lefties just as effectively as he gets out righties. Because we all know what Darren O'Day does. Brian Mattis, uh, outstanding against lefties. There are plenty of weapons down there to mix and match in the sixth and seventh. And then obviously you get O'Day and you get Britain at the back end in the eighth and the ninth. You have a pretty good, you feel like you have a very good chance to win on that day if you're winning going into the seventh inning. And Brian is expected to pitch in this game today, which would be his first appearance since March the 2nd. He came up with that sore lower back pitching in that game. I was right here against Atlanta. One and two on Morrison, runner at first now with two down. Check swing at a pitch upstairs. He did not go. Tillman has looked very crisp so far, though. The the command looks good. That looked like an intentional fastball up that he that he has used uh, very effectively in the past. The curveball looks sharper. The, the cutter slider he's trying to incorporate looks good. So I love what I'm seeing out of Chris Tillman today, and he's very aggressive in the zone. A two and two with two down. High fly ball to center field. Jones back on it. That ball's got a lot of carry, and that ball is gone. That's over the batter's eye in deep center field. So Logan Morrison gets in the one. He hits it out. It's a four to two game. One of Chris's few mistakes so far today. He had a, got him in a good two strike count and he left a fastball over the middle of the plate down, which is deadly to a left handed hitter. As we see here, this is not where he wanted it. He wanted to go down and in and it leaked back over the middle of the plate. Morrison is a big, strong guy. A uh, lot of power. You see him drive it over the center field wall. So the first home run Chris is allowed on the spring, and this is second a game start. Here's Longoria. And there's a strike. Now with the rotation not announced, and with Kevin Gosman now down at least uh, three days with the uh, cortisone shot for his shoulder tendonitis, the auditions keep going. And on Thursday night, as that ball's hit deep to left field off the bat of Longoria, and that ball's going to get out of here. So the Rays go back to back, and it's a one run game. Tillman left another fastball out over the plate, and Evan Longoria, we see him do it a lot in his career. He kind of knows what to do with that. These are the kind of things, though, that, that Buck talks about a lot. You can get fooled a little bit in spring training. You look out, you see the flags blowing dead out to left field. Uh, certainly the one that was hit to center by uh, Logan Morrison was hit well. This ball's hit well, but it may not be a home run in the regular season. Uh, not a bad pitch. He wants it to be up and out. This one was the one that he wants back. It was supposed to be a cutter down and in. It, it kind of spun back over the middle of the plate, and those are the ones, uh, those are the mistakes that you can't make. Uh, and what I really wanted to see was how he bounced back from the two-run home run. Uh, limit the damage. You've already, you've got a, you had a four-nothing lead. Now it's at four-three. Let's see if we can limit that damage. Well, this uh, was one of the things that played Chris last year was the big inning. And limit the damage, as you alluded to, and get to the bench and get your team up there. Three-run inning for Tampa Bay. But the competition is still going on. You know, Tyler Wilson has had a great spring. Mike Wright on Thursday night here, a night game against Minnesota, pitched five shutout innings on four hits. And he only struck out two, and he was pleased with that. He was pounding the strike zone, challenging hitters, and he was getting outs. Well, those two are definitely your wild cards, I think, in a lot of ways. Uh, they're, they're still young kids. You're not 100% sure what you're going to do. Mike Wright has explosive stuff. Tyler Wilson has won everywhere he's been, all the way from high school through college at UVA. Uh, so there are options. You know, Buck and, and the coaching staff has options of what they want to do. Uh, these are the kind of days that we talked about early on uh, in our broadcast of 
you start to need to see results. Guys are going to have to start to go out there and get it done, um, or else they're going to try to find somebody else. And so uh, these last 11 days are going to show a lot of what guys are made up of. And Buck, before the game, he was asked about the depth uh, since the rotation at this point is not yet settled on. And he said one of the keys is you need optionable depth because, uh, as we mentioned, eight starters last year, while Wilson and Wright are optionable depth. And, and nobody is going to go through the season with the same five starters all year. It's just not going to happen. So you need that depth. You have to have that depth. You have to have the optionable depth, as you're talking about, so that you don't lose them when you send them down or, or risk that uh, possibility. So uh, the Orioles are in a, in a good spot. You see Giovanni Gallardo there coming over to try and really solidify the front of this rotation. But what they're really trying to look for is, uh, is some uh, solid arms in the back of the rotation. Dickerson strikes out to end it. Tampa Bay gets three. We'll head to the bottom of the third in a one-run game. Well, we're back here in Sarasota as the Orioles lead at 4-3. And don't forget, all kids 14 and under can join the Junior Orioles Dugout Club and enjoy a new lineup of excitement. The membership options now include your choice of two six-game packages filled with exclusive benefits like game tickets, a club hat, sunglasses, messenger bag, and more. And as always, friends and family can purchase additional tickets to Dugout Club games for as little as $6, and lower-level seating options are available. So get your tickets now. Birdland's best value in family entertainment. Orioles.com slash dugout club or 888-848-BIRD. Chris Davis takes ball one. And a breaking ball that bounces in there. So it was a 4-3 game. McPherson on him relief. Davis rips that ball to right field, and even against the shift, he finds some real estate. Souza has to play it on a hop. That's always a good sign to see Chris get to head to an inside fastball. He gets to a 2-0 and count. Knows he's probably going to get a heater. Uh, pulls his hands in, drives it over the shift. This is a pitch that early in his career he had trouble with, was the fastball in, and people thought they could pound him in there. Uh, he has learned to get his hands to that ball. Uh, be able to do some damage with it as well. Uh, so good to see Chris swinging the bat today. So he's been on base twice, and here's Mark Trumbo. He was called out on strikes his first at bat. I'm going to foul the back. There's a spring training foul ball. Yep. I'm not sure he missed that one in the regular season very often. Oh, 
Dumbo was called out on strikes this first half bat. Davis, with that stolen base ability, draws a throw. <laughs> Chris has always been known as a speedster. He will sneak one every now and then. He actually is an extremely good athlete and runs a lot better than people think, but uh, that's certainly not what they gave him the big contract to do. Another foul ball straight back in the screen. Well, Trumbo's going to fit in. He was acquired from Seattle in the Steve Clevenger trade. At that point, Chris had not yet re-signed. So Dan Duquette was uh, getting some insurance, uh, somebody to play first base. They could hit for power. And then when Chris signed, it appeared that Mark would slide into the DH spot. And when Pedro Alvarez signed, Mark slid into the right field spot. So the versatility of the player has really helped the Orioles. One acquisition, and he's already penciled into his third different spot. Doesn't hurt that he's got 30 home run power, too, and you see that guy sitting right there, Pedro Alvarez, uh, waiting on Chris Davis. They ended up uh, signing two more guys that have 30 home run power. This is a lineup that is just filled with, and there you see a ball driven to left center field. That ball is carrying and gone also. What a great swing by Trumbo. He got an 0-2 hanging breaking ball, and he knows what to do with it. Two-run home run driving in Chris Davis to make the score six to three. Orioles here in the top in the bottom of the third. Well, this is going to be Oriole baseball this year. Get on base and let somebody try to drive you in. Trumbo, his third home run of the spring, and he now has 10 RBIs. You can see him starting to get very comfortable at the plate. Uh, as we talked about earlier, you get comfortable in your surroundings. The game starts to slow down a little bit. You get more comfortable with your teammates. You start to uh, not press as much, and you don't miss the pitches that you miss in the that you don't miss in the regular season, like that hanging breaking ball we just saw. Yeah, don't hang your curve to this guy. And here it is. You get to 0-2. You kind of think you're in trouble, and then your eyes light up. You say, "Whoa, that's a hanger." You get the foot down, hands stay back. And a big, strong guy like that's able to drive that out to left center. Now, that replay was a perfect example of what you talked about earlier about allowing the game to slow down. He recognized it, he held back, and then he put on an authoritative swing. And that's what happens when the game is fast, especially early on in spring training. You're trying to catch up to the fastball so your hands can't stay back on a breaking ball. See another really good swing here from Kim. He's starting to swing the bat. These are a lot of good signs for Orioles fans when you see Mark Trumbo going deep. Kim getting on base at a, at a really good clip over his last five or six games. Uh, so, you know, when the game does start to slow down, you're able to recognize pitches. You're not rushing for the fastball and out ahead of the breaking ball. And we're starting to see guys to lock it in a little bit now. So Kim is two for two. And here's J.J. Hardy was called down on strikes his first at bat. Orioles bat took, took some time to come along. Go behind Kim and he gets back in and just does get back in. Rene Rivera loves throwing the ball around. This is a lineup that there's just no there's no break. There's no place to breathe. You know, you get down to seven, eight, nine. You're talking about Hardy, who's hit 30 homers. Scope, who may have as much power as anybody in the lineup besides C besides Chris Davis, maybe. So it just, there's no place to take a break and feel like you're going to uh, work through a couple hitters and get back to feeling good on the mound. Uh, and it, the line just keeps going. And now you got J.J. in a 2-0 count. He's ready to let it rip again, I'm sure. Hit the left field with authority, and that's down for a base hit. Nice job by Dickerson to cut it off. So Kim has to stop at second base. Another nice piece of hitting there by JJ. He gets into a hitter's count, the count that you love to get into as a hitter, 2 0. Oh. You know a fastball's coming, you want to get the head out. Uh, we saw Chris Davis do it just a couple hitters earlier, got the same thing, 2 0, oh, got a fastball, drove it to right field. Um, the Orioles are rolling right now. All right, so Hardy on at second, and here's Jonathan Scope, and consistency is what you look for in the spring. Now, here's Jonathan's numbers. 15 hits, batting average, and he has made 13 starts and has a base hit in all 13 of his starts. The only game he didn't get a hit in, he replaced Flaherty late in the game and went 0 for 1. 
Well, I'm sure there are some guys telling him to not peak too early right. at this point. You there know, you <laughs> look, you never get, uh, you never want to fail, that's for sure. So it's great to see Jonathan swinging the bat that way. Uh, I think he's very comfortable right now. You know, he, uh, uh, the first couple years he was in and out of the lineup. He had some injuries, um, wasn't playing consistently. He knows that he's the guy now. And it makes it so much easier when you know that you're the guy and you're going to be out there every single day. And I think Jonathan is at that place in his career. And I think you're looking at a huge year coming up from him looks over ball one and the breaky ball for a strike generous call there I like to the take though you uh, Jonathan sometimes gets a little bit antsy he likes to swing and there's nothing wrong with that that's a good thing but he added a 1-0 count right there he's in a hitter's count didn't see the pitch that he liked laid off of it it happened to be a strike but now you, you now you can still look for the one that you want the two on and still nobody out Ground ball towards the hole. Longoria plucks it to second one and back to the first. Nicely turned. And just like that, two men down. Him ends up at third. Pitcher's best friend is a double play. You know, he had a breaking ball that was up. He didn't do maybe what he wanted to. Longoria makes a great play to his left, flips it over. Foresight turns it nicely. All of a sudden, you have two outs and a man on third, and you're looking for a, a two-out hit with a man in scoring position. Caleb Joseph with a really good at-bat his first time. See if he can do it again. The Orioles now with eight base hits through two and two-thirds innings. And all six runs coming in. There's a soft line drive, and that's a base hit for Caleb Joseph, and here's Kim to score. So Caleb is two out of two, and it's 7-3 O's. Big two out RBI, that's what you're looking for. Those are hard to come by. Caleb sees a, a first pitch breaking ball, stays right on it, able to get enough of it just to drive it into uh, shallow left center and score Kim. So good sign for the Orioles to get two out RBI singles. Now Caleb is getting more reps with Matt Weider's sideline, and there's that timing factor again that keeps resurfacing depending on the player. It really does. It's, it's Baseball is a game of repetition. And you and I talked about earlier that uh, sometimes people talk about when you get to the big leagues, you will need to get 1,500 at-bats in order to feel really comfortable. Well, in spring training, there's a number for everybody as well. And you see some of these guys are starting to get there, I think. Manny, first ball swinging, skies out. And that'll end the inning. But uh, Mark Trumbo gets into a hanging breaking ball. He hits it out deep to left center field. The O's with a 7-3 lead. Well, visit Orioles.com slash spring, and you could bid on the special green Orioles caps and jerseys that the team wore on St. Patrick's Day. Each item has been autographed and authenticated, and is now available for auction. The proceeds will benefit the Marie Selby Botanical Gardens, a world-renowned botanical research center and a leader in environmental education located right here along the Sarasota Bay. Support this great organization and pick up a unique Orioles collector's item. Bidding closes at 10 p.m. on Thursday, so visit Orioles.com slash spring. And those uniforms, that was on Thursday night here for the night game. They were really good looking. 
And what a great place, uh, Marie Selby Botanical Gardens. We go there as a family. My, my son loves it. It is a beautiful place on the water over there. If you haven't been, definitely need to go check it out. So Tillman on for his fourth inning of work. First ball swinging as Sousa Jr. in the shift. There's Scope. One time shortstop throws him out. You got three former shortstops in that shift on that side. <laughs> and all of them with plenty of arm strength to play on that side of the field, that's for sure. This is a this is an infield defense that you want to get as many ground balls as possible because they are spectacular out there. Jonathan came into the Orioles organization ahead of Manny. And every time John was assigned to a team, he was the shortstop until Manny got there. And then he wasn't the shortstop because Manny became the shortstop. Here's Kiermaier. And a swing and a miss. It's a good problem to have, two options like that out there uh, when, you're in a minor, when you're a minor league manager, that's for sure. And then they also had, at one time, Michael Gibbons was in that mix. Then converted Turned to out to be pretty good on the mound. Yeah, absolutely. Tillman's been very efficient. You see 51 pitches so far. I really like what I'm seeing out of him. He gave up a couple home runs, you know, possibly some wins. Uh, both of them hit pretty well, but I think overall he's thrown the ball the way that he was looking to today, more so than uh, he has yet this spring. One of the things about Matty and Jonathan, they are inseparable. They're always together. They're in the same hitting group in BP by design. Two and one on Kiermaier. And... They do have a little bit of a rivalry between them. And during games, they actually critique the play the other made. So if Jonathan makes a play, Manny will look over and give him a thumbs up. Or, ah, that wasn't so yeah. great. I could have done that. And the other thing they're always arguing about is who has the stronger throwing line. Now, I think it's Jonathan. Manny disagrees. Oh, wow. Jonathan disagrees. That's, uh, I know one thing. Um... I know a lot of guys who would take either one. I would have taken either one of them, that's for sure. And, and they're both such big kids. You know, we were out, I was out there on the field with them the other day, and, and they're messing around, almost wrestling like two brothers, you know. Uh, hey, hey, B-Rob, who do you think would win? Who do you think would win? I said, I don't want a piece of either one of you, that's for sure. But, you know, I had an opportunity when I was rehabbing a couple times uh, to go down to Double-A Bowie, and, and they were both down there. And they've been doing this for years together, and they, and they really, really like each other. They have a great relationship. And that's so important because you spend so much time with these guys. And uh, to have a friend like that is awesome. And it, and it really makes you feel so much more comfortable at the stadium every day. 3-2 is fouled back. And, of course, uh, as each was coming along as shortstops, you, you would expect that they would have strong arms. You need that arm to be able to make that throw from deep in the hole. Yeah, that's what, that's what people gauge whether you can play shortstop or not, is can you go to your right, can you go deep in the hole and make that throw across the diamond? And neither one of those guys had a problem doing that, that's for sure. Right, three, two. Good change up there by Telly on a 3-2 count. Uh, he had him kind of on a string going back and forth with the fastball, the cutter, and then he finishes him off with a change up. Nice framing there, or excuse me, presenting. That's uh, what we, I know call you and, we call it now, presenting. I know you and Mike Boyd go back and forth on, <laughs> on if that's framing or presenting, but well caught by Caleb Joseph. Who is uh, one of the best at doing that. Uh, Tillman looking for his second three-up, three-down inning. Here's Beckham. And a foul tip held by Caleb. Another good change up there, right on right change up to start the at bat. He struck him out on a curveball looking last time. I'm interested to see the sequence this time around with Beckham. And that one came out of his hand. Tim Beckham now 26 years old, and the Rays are still waiting for him to put it all together. He was the number one overall pick as he hits it down the line back in 2008. Trumbo's going to try to dig it out. Beckham has good speed. He is thinking three. Makes the turn as Trumbo gets it back in. The throw from Scope is just late. And there's a two-out triple for Beckham, who just sliced it down the line. And that's the talent that I think you said they've been waiting to try and see on a more consistent basis. You see him take a fastball and hit a rocket down the right field line and then turn it on between first and second. Good piece of hitting here with the fastball away. Slices it down, keeps it just inside the line. Trumbo with a long run, and here he is. He's kicking it into 
second, third, fourth gear. Head first slide on the end to finish it off. You know, that's what a number one pick looks like, but can they do it on a regular basis? That's what they're waiting for him to really do. Number one overall, Pedro Alvarez, now with the Orioles, went number two. Tampa Bay did not need a third baseman because they had Longoria. Eric Hosmer went number three, and he's a Florida kid. But they passed on him in that draft, and the Orioles took Brian Mattis. And with the fifth pick, uh, another Florida kid, somebody by the name of Buster Posey, <laughs> went to the Giants. So, of course, uh, it's an inexact science. On draft day, we can look back now, but I'm sure the Rays, looking at that, may have gone a different direction. Hindsight certainly is 2020 when it comes to a Major League Baseball draft, that's for sure. Especially if it's a high school kid, and Beckham was a high school kid. Yeah, you know, you take a college kids, they're, they're two, three, four years older and, and farther down the line, so you may know a little bit more about what you're going to get. A lot of times they're a little bit raw coming out of high school. 2-0 and on Loney. With two down, the runner at third. Another good off-speed pitch. Really good 2-0 changeup. This is another situation that you want to see uh, Tilly gets two quick outs, and, and, and you've just scored three runs in the bottom half of the inning. You want to shut down half inning here in the top of the fourth. He got two quick outs, gives up the triple. Can you get out of this inning without giving up another run and get your guys back in the dugout, let them swing the bat again? Fastball just missed. I think he had Loney fooled there. Well, this is also one of those at bats during the during the season that you'll see where you've got a quality, very quality major league hitter, veteran, and James Loney uh, hitting. You see T.J. McFarland warming up in the bullpen, but you also have Rene Rivera, a catcher who may not swing the bat as well in the on deck circle. You take your chances with, as you see, a three one change up there. I'm not going to give in to Loney uh, with Rivera on deck possibly. Those are the things that I talk about now. This late in spring training, you're going to see guys start pitching more like they would in the regular season. I think it's smart. Well, the corners are covered. Beckham at third, Loney at first, and here is Rivera skied out his first at bat. So Tillman, who lasted just an inning and two thirds on Tuesday, is an out away from going through four. Breaking ball and down the line. Navi with the play. Off balance. Oh, scoop by Davis on the back end. Lightning wow, glove nice. and gold glove on the back side. What a play by Machado as he saves a run in the foul ground. Cross the body, gets it across, and Davis with the pick on the back end. How fast is it?
Well, make your plans now because this year, after every Sunday home game, your kids' big league dreams can come true. All fans 14 and under can run the bases, make every Sunday family day at Oriole Park, and enjoy a great afternoon of baseball capped off with the memory of watching your children running the same bases as their favorite birds. Don't miss Kids Run the Bases Day every Sunday home game throughout the season. Check out the schedule for your tickets. Go online, Orioles.com, or just call 888-848-BIRD. A lot of kids here in Florida, spring break. It's Easter next Sunday, so a lot of the youngsters coming out to see Orioles baseball as the birds continue to draw well at Ed Smith Stadium. And here is Pedro Alvarez leading off. McPherson stays on. Pedro with a grand slam his last at bat. Big, big blow with two down in the inning. Tries to time the off-speed pitch and fouls it back. Kyle McPherson has had just 10 games of experience in the major leagues. That was with the Pirates in 2012. Here's another Tommy John surgery survivor. He missed all of 2014 recovering from that. He came up through the Pirates organization until coming over to Tampa Bay. Brought along slowly last year coming back. What a good looking curveball that was. And Pedro throws in. He's down on strikes and one away. Yeah, you see what made him a top prospect in that Pittsburgh organization at one point. This is a big time breaking ball. Backdoor. There's not a whole lot you can do as a hitter except that right there. Put your foot down and say, well, that was a pitch I couldn't hit. Pearson now 28 years old. He's out of Alabama. Here's Adam Jones, who has bounced out twice. Lays off the high fastball. Adam hit a home run here on Thursday night that was just remarkable because it was a pitch that he normally wouldn't swing at. It was a fastball that was up in the zone. And Brian, you want to talk about bat speed. He, he had one of those like tomahawk swings and the bat just went through the zone and he hit it to the pavilion behind the picnic area in left field. I think I have seen him do that maybe more than anybody I ever played with would be able to get on top of a good fastball at the letters and hit it that hard is truly uh, it's a special gift to have that kind of bat speed. I think him and Miguel Tejada were probably the two best I ever saw at being able to get on top of those kind of pitches. So uh, Jonesy just has a, an incredible amount of athletic ability and bat speed. And, and that is a long ways to hit it out in that pavilion, especially on a ball that's up there. I mean, look at that. Look how far that is. Breaking ball, tried to time it, fouled it back. You know, we're, we're, from where Adam Jones came from when he came over from Seattle, uh, it's really been remarkable to see the progression of Adam Jones, the baseball player, uh, laying off sliders in the dirt, being able to get on top of the good fastball. All those things that he has progressed and done, uh, it's really been phenomenal to watch. And he gets him with a fastball, so Adam down on strikes and two away. Well, talking about balance, and the Orioles certainly feel they have it. But... Brian, here are the career home run numbers for the Orioles. Uh, I think that 217 from last year may be shattered. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you have the potential, that is for sure. You know, everything always uh, looks good on paper in spring training. But when you look at this, I mean, you're talking about 53, 36, 35 from Manny last year. Probably the tip of the iceberg. Mark Trumbo with 34, Adam Jones 33, on down the line. And then Scope uh, has 30 to 35 home run potential, in my opinion. So... I do think that that 217 number could be in jeopardy uh, if everyone stays healthy, which we know is certainly a, a big key. So we've listed eight players there that have the potential to make a run at that, including Mr. Scope, who had 15 last year in half a season. The mo most the Orioles have ever had in any single season is two players with 30 home runs. I think you have a very realistic uh, possibility of beating that. I, I mean, I think there will be... 
I think there's going to be five. I really believe you'll have five guys that will be close to, if not over, 30 home runs. And that takes you to 150 right there. It doesn't even include any of the other guys chipping in or, or the guys with 15 or 20. So uh, it's going to be fun to watch. There's going to be a lot of people shagging foul walls up on the flag foot in Camden Yards this year. Well, if five hit 30, that would set a new major league record. The major league record is four players with at least 30 home runs. Well, that would certainly be uh, something to, to look at as the year goes on. Twelve times a team has had four players at 30. The most recent was the 2009 Phillies. That was uh, Ryan Howard's big year. He had 45 that year. One and two on Davis, who's prolonging the at-bat with the foul balls. Off-speed pitch popped up. Beckham in the shift, comes back over to third. And he's got it for the out. So McPherson has a three up, three down inning. We are through four in Sarasota. The O's have the lead. I do everything. Tillman today took the mound. He, I thought he looked really good. He went uh, four innings, struck out five. We saw him utilize all of his pitches. We talked about the curveball in the opening. We talked about the cutter. You see the change up there. This is the time of spring that they break out the full arsenal, and it becomes more and more about results. I think Tillman's going to be extremely happy with uh, the results today. Gave up two home runs, certainly, which uh, weren't ideal, but I think the win had a factor in one of those. Um, and I really liked what I saw from Chris today. Well, T.J. McFarland, who uh, nursed a, a sore elbow for a short time, making a second appearance since then, and he's on the mound. The last year gave the Orioles some quality innings. T.J. McFarland, obviously a, a former Rule 5 pick from the Indians back in 2012. Uh, Buck really loves his versatility. I know when he came over, uh, Buck fell in love with the fact that he could go multiple innings. He could do a lot of different things in the bullpen. He's got a quality sinker that results in a lot of ground balls. In fact, had the second highest uh, ground ball rate among American League uh, relievers last year at 65%. Pounds the zone, pounds down in the zone, and when you've got an infield defense like the Orioles do, that's a good combination. Top of the order against McFarlane as Forsyth will lead off. And there's a pitch for a strike going one. Let's head out to the uh, Orioles bullpen area and welcome in Orioles starter Chris Tillman, who was outstanding today. Chris, four solid innings. What'd you think? You know, it was, it was better than last time. And um, I came in with the mindset I wanted to work on a couple things. And, you know, I made a couple good pitches with it and a couple that hurt me. But, um, you know, I'm glad I stuck with it and we're able to make uh, some good pitches and get through it. Oh, you said uh, that you came in wanting to work on a couple of things. You and I talked a little bit the other day, Chris, about uh, the curveball, trying to get a better feel for the spin and the rotation. I thought it was pretty good at times today. You had uh, a couple of punch outs on it. Did you feel like you had a little better feel of it today than you've had most of the spring? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I made some good pitches with it early. Um, I left one you know, a little bit too much arm side early in the game. The guy hit the, the double down the line. Um, but... 
I think uh, it got better as the game went. We got a little tighter, and I felt, uh, you know, I could throw for a strike when I needed to and, and bury it when I when I needed to. Chris, as uh, you project out to the beginning of the season, opening day, amazing, uh, just two weeks uh, away tomorrow. What is the, the pitch that you feel you really need to have consistent command of in order to succeed? My fastball. I think uh, every pitcher is the same way. You, you need your fastball both sides of the plate. And not just every now and then, but you need to command it. And, uh, you know, all your other stuff plays off that. Uh, if, if you go into the season without that, um, you know, it's a grind. You can get it done, but it makes life much easier when you can command the fastball. Chris, as a hitter and a pitcher, we all know how important and how crucial the legs are to our success. Uh, we know you had the hip injury early in spring training. Today, did you feel like you were able to get out there and really drive? Are you able to do the things that you want to do when it comes to your conditioning, your strength training, all that sort of stuff to put you in a position to succeed? You know what? Conditioning is going well. I felt it a little bit today to where... Um, I wasn't able to, to make some pitches that I needed to, but I've had it so many times in my career, and I've, I've pitched through it, and I come out better at the end when, when I, go, I do go through it. You know, I get it about once or twice a year, and, um, you know, it just feels a little bit wacky, not, not normal. And, um, you know, I, I, was, I was happy I was able to make a lot of good pitches with it today, and, you know, it's encouraging. So since you've lived with this in the past, you're not concerned about the feeling the effects of that? No, not at all. You know what? You know, I've done it so many times, and um, it's it's something that every, every pitcher has. It's not just me. It's everybody. If they're 100% healthy, then they're lying to you, you know? So <laughs> I think, you know, Robbie, you can attest to that. But. Yeah. yeah, I think it's something that people don't understand probably a lot of times is that we deal with a lot of nagging things that you... You just don't have a choice or else you won't be on the field very often. So I understand that. What uh, Looking towards the, this last 11, 12 days of camp uh, and your next couple outings, what, what's the biggest thing that you really want to get accomplished going into the regular season? Is it um, getting your pitch count up to a certain number? Is it getting through a certain number of innings? Uh, what do you really look to accomplish in these last couple outings? The pitch count is, is, the, is the big thing. I think, um, you know, ups and downs. When, you know, today I got up and down four times, and I think that's that's important. You know, as, as you move on, you like to get up, up and down a few more times, and get ready for this, get, get ready for the season. I think pitch count. You know, and I never really got tired. It's the the, the time in between innings when you're sitting there watching, watching the guys hit the ball over the yard. You know, it's it's fun, but at the same time, we need to to get those ups and downs more. All right, now Chris, uh, the key question here is: Brian said, you know, he has seen you go by his house with your boat. But you don't stop to pick them up. I mean, uh, you know, you, you either take them fishing or are you going to, you know, hey, let's go out for a little cruise. What, what's up with that? If, if Robbie would answer his phone, he would have been on the boat. <laughs> <laughs> See, it is on you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, man. And it's nice to have them as neighbors. You know, I got him and Zach Britton living down the street from me, so it, it's a good place to be. Uh, Chris, uh, just outstanding today as uh, you got into four innings and a uh, really good start. We appreciate the visit. And stay healthy. Keep it going. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. All right, that's Chris. Tillman uh, working on things. How about that? He says that the hip comes and goes. And that's, uh, that's incredible that he could still be as effective even though he knows that he, he can't maybe utilize certain pitches because of it. You know, I, I think he's exactly right. The guys just have nagging things that, that bother them throughout their career. Uh, I know that, you know, I had certain things that you, you thought they were going to go away after the offseason, and you get back to spring training, you're halfway through, and you're like, wait a minute, this again? You know, and it doesn't keep you off the field, but it's just nagging, and, and you learn to deal with it. And obviously, Chris has this thing that he has learned to deal with and pitch through. And, um, it's not ideal, but it is part of being a professional athlete. Well, I think uh, the best information there is that he's not concerned. Uh, if there was concern, he, he wouldn't be as optimistic, but he knows how to navigate through it. So that's a real good day. The, you know, the back-to-back -back home runs, uh, notwithstanding, but uh, he still gave the Orioles four solid innings. And as he said, the pitch count elevation was the key for today. Yeah, that, and as he talks about getting up and down, you know, it, it's uh, it's really those things that you you kind of forget about over the offseason is how much sitting and waiting 20, 15, 20 minutes in between innings can wear on you and, and, and getting your body going again. So I think he's right about just crossing all of these uh, checking all these boxes off before spring training and, and feeling more and more comfortable with it. So an error at an infield hit, and it's one and one on Longoria. So McFarland with a bit of a stressful inning here. It looked like on that ball that was hit to Manny, it may have hit the lip of the grass before it got to him, and it changed the uh, 
the direction of the bounce. Well, on, on these days when the wind's blowing, it's hot, it's humid. You start to get into the fourth, fifth inning, that dirt starts to get really hard. It's not wet anymore. It starts to bounce a little bit more like a bouncy ball and not a baseball. And I think that's what happened to Manny. It came up a little higher on him than he thought, whether it was the lip or the hard dirt. Uh, and as a ground ball pitcher, which we talked about, TJ, is sometimes you get this bad luck. You get an error, you get an infield dribbler, and now you get another blooper and you got the bases loaded. Uh, that's part of... That's the part of the game that you can't control, unfortunately, sometimes when you're on the mound. So right off the end of the bat for Longoria to base hit. Yeah, the fields in spring training, always a topic of conversation, and this is one of the best fields in Florida. Let's go back and take a look at the Matty error, see where it bounced. Uh, TJ throws a good sinker. He gets it off kind of the end of the bat, and that last bounce goes actually off of the grass. It was on the grass. You know, I think if Manny was being honest with you, he'd probably tell you that was maybe just a little bit more a lack of concentration than a, than a really bad bounce. I think you could kind of tell by his facial expression he may have just taken it a little bit more um, lackadaisical than he wanted to. Well, Corey Dickerson now with a chance. Tampa Bay is trailing by four, but the bases are loaded and nobody out. These are the high leverage situations also that... Uh, I think you're the staff and, and as a player sometimes it's nice to get into in spring training You certainly don't want to give up hits. And you don't want to give up runs But uh, you need to be in these situations that that cause you to to buckle down a little bit and, and make some pitches and TJ's in this spot We'll see how he reacts to it Good call there by Caleb Joseph came in off speed on the first pitch and Dickerson was well out in front a Forsyth Morrison and Longoria third to first with Corey Dickerson facing McFarland. So if you're TJ, who does get his share of ground balls, you know, there's a ground ball to scope. You turn two and rumble score, but it could short circuit the inning. You certainly trade a run for two outs at this point. I'm being up seven to three, and, and TJ's looking. I think he will come back with a sinker here and try to get that ground ball and get two outs for one pitch. There's a the good sinker right there with good velocity, too, at 93. Hitters are having a tough time with Will Little today, and now the bench is getting on him from the Tampa Bay side. There have been a lot of uh, hesitant calls there where he looks it over and then decides, yeah, I did like that pick. You know, managers have to work on things too in spring training. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> you got to get in midseason form and remember how to yell at an umpire and make your point. Well, there's a huge out foul tip held by Caleb. And Dickerson is going to walk away dejected. Good sequence of pitches there with the bases loaded by TJ. Start him off with a breaking ball and then come back with two really good sinkers. Here you see that arm side run. That's tough on a left on left matchup. Dickerson gets the foot down but couldn't recognize the fact that that ball was sinking down and out of the zone underneath his hands. Now you get that ground ball. You're out of the inning with no runs. And that's these are the situations as we talked about that I think are really important. And I think he, uh, he's going to get this ground ball to J.J. Hardy right here and get out of that inning with no runs. Steven Sousa Jr. That ball's tagged to deep right center field, way out there towards the scoreboard. And that ball is gone. That is a grand slam for Sousa, and we are tied. It just got out by the video board in right center field. Well, that was the sinker that didn't sink. Left it out up and over the plate a little bit. And Souza put a great swing on it. Takes it out to right center over by the scoreboard. Ties the game up at seven. Here's the sinker that he wants to get the ground ball on, but it just doesn't sink. You see a thigh high, and he stays right on it. He knows with a sinker ball pitcher, you're going to have to stay on this ball or else you will roll over it, and it will be a ground ball. He stayed right on it and drove it into the right center field gap for a grand slam. Kiermaier waves at the off-speed pitch. Well, we've been talking quite a bit about the Orioles' home run potential. Tampa Bay has seven runs in this game, all seven coming in on three home runs. They have a solo, a two-run, and now a grand slam. For the Orioles, six of their seven runs have come in on two home runs. Tampa not necessarily a team that you think of and correlate with the long ball a lot. Uh, but they went out and got Dickerson, which is, uh, he's got extremely good power. As you see TJ punch out uh, for super out number two right there. But they're not a team that you really uh, necessarily correlate with a lot of home runs. 
There's the sinker that he was looking for on the last one, and Kiermaier couldn't recognize that one as well down out of the zone. Um, and that's, you know, that's part of spring training is some are going to sink better than others, and you've got to learn to work through it, and that's what uh, TJ's doing right now. And he just did get back on the mound on Wednesday, so his second appearance since. And Beckham takes ball one. Beckham tripled his last at-bat. That was against Chris Tillman, but he was left stranded. So the error in this inning has cost the Orioles a run, and it's also cost McFarland an out. Extra outs are tough to work around, and uh, the Orioles are one of the best teams in baseball at not giving you the extra out. Uh, but as you see, when you do give a team an extra out, it can be it can make it very difficult on your pitcher. You get next thing you know, you get in a little infield dribbler, then a mm -hmm. blooper, and 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 it's a tie game. And and that's what you see in the big leagues is every team is capable of scoring runs quick. And uh, so you have to take care of the ball. You have to get the outs that you that you're supposed to get. Yeah, for McFarland, it wasn't the sinker that didn't sink to Souza. It was the three batters before that set up the inning. I mean, he had Morrison way out in front. He just happened to place it just in front of Scope, who charged, made a nice effort, but just missed getting him at first. There's a chopper to Hardy. J.J. with a nice hop. And the inning ends with a grand slam by Souza has tied this game. Mid-fifth in Sarasota. Great day for the beach in a 7-7 game. There's a lot to see. Well, we hope you can join us coming up on Friday. More O's action from spring training. The birds will welcome the Yankees into Ed Smith Stadium. Our coverage on Masson begins at 1 o'clock. Be sure to log on to MassonSports.com all spring long for daily news and notes from Oriole Spring Training. Rock Cabaco has you covered at MassonSports.com. New pitcher Tyler Sturdivant. You see last season in AAA, 26 games, 3.16 ERA. Guy that brings depth to their organization, mostly a fastball cutter guy, adds in the curveball and the changeup. 30 years old, trying to make his way to the big leagues for the first time, never been up before. Here's a chance to make an impression on your staff right here. And a few defensive changes in center field in place of Kiermeyer. There's Braxton Lee. Keon Wong is now at third base, and Riley Unruh is at second base. And here's Trumbo, and here's what he did to a hanging breaking ball his last at bat. Yeah, he gets a hanger right there, and he knows exactly what to do with it. Keeps the hands back, as we talked about. Starting to recognize pitches a little bit earlier, and he deposits it over the left center field wall for a home run. And the fastball outside, 1-0. So Loney and Rivera stay in. They have only had two plate appearances. The three starters who have left all had three. And 
And this is the tough part of spring training right here, Jim, is the fact that you start to feel like you're kind of in a rhythm. You're starting to swing the bat pretty well. And you get a guy who's been in AAA, he's never been in the big leagues, you've never seen him before, you have no idea what he has. And that's why numbers, that's why things can be a little bit deceiving in spring training is because you're not facing guys that, you, that you've that you seen before. You know what they uh, are going to try and do to you at all. So it becomes very difficult. And you see Trumbo, I, I, I love the approach right there. He takes the slider down and away, cutter down and away, and he drives it to right field. That's a productive at bat, even though it doesn't result in a hit. So here comes Sturdivant to face Soon Su Kim, whose bat is really coming on. How about this contrast? 0 for 21 in his first seven games, 8 for 18 in the last seven, a 444 clip. Of course, then you have a guy like Kim who said, I've never seen any of these guys. No right. matter who they are. So uh, that makes the transition even more difficult. Uh, and he's starting to starting to really swing the bat well. You're seeing him stay on balls, drive him up the middle. Uh, probably not as antsy and not as jumpy. Good take right there on the first pitch. Well, Kim with two hits today has scored twice each time he singled. He came around the score. Of course, uh, he's in the competition for the opening day start in left field. As you get a look at the defense, uh, they're still learning him. Tampa Bay, they love the shift. Yeah, they, they don't even know him, and they're shifting him. They shifted on Ryan Flaherty the last time they were here. Swing and a miss. The one and two to count on Kim. Well, they were really... They were really the, the the team that started the whole shift thing and then really set the whole thing in motion. Joe Madden not afraid to go outside the box and do something different. And, and they were the team that was shifting before everybody else. One out, none on, one and two on Kim. Hops up the breaking ball left field. There's Dickerson coming in on it. And two outs on two fly balls. Well, there are signs that camp is coming to a conclusion, to a climax. Tomorrow is the team's only day off, so they're all looking forward to that. And uh, uh, the Orioles Public Relations Department put out the word, the gates will be locked. <laughs> they don't want anybody sneaking in here, doing some workouts, or uh, a lot of the players with their families, uh, some maybe heading to Disney World uh, in Orlando. Here's J.J. Hardy. And then... Uh, the next sign that things are getting closer and closer to Baltimore, the first of the two equipment trucks that will bring luggage and equipment back leaves next Saturday. When the, when the big trucks start rolling in, everybody gets very excited, that's for sure. And, and tomorrow will be a well-deserved day off for these guys. They've been going at it for now, you know, four or five weeks straight with no days off. Uh, be a lot of guys on the beach or on the boat or at Disney World and, and hopefully come back refreshed on Tuesday to, for those last 10 or 11 days before we get out of here. Yeah, doing as uh, little as possible. Relaxation. Ball on a strike on Hardy. And that ball's nubbed foul back of the plate. And then, of course, wouldn't you know it, when uh, the Orioles come off the day off, they have back-to-back -back road games. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Fort Myers uh, on Tuesday against Minnesota, and then Bradenton which is the closest to the uh, ballpark here. It's about 12 miles away, just north of here. Yeah, with the Fort Myers trip on Tuesday, some of the veteran guys might get two days off and, and then he head over to Bradenton for the Pirates game. So I'm sure Buck will take advantage of, of trying to get a few of those guys a couple extra days before they really kick it into gear. We'll have the Wednesday game against the Pirates in Bradenton on the Orioles radio network. And then back on Masson next Friday against the Yankees. Chopper towards the middle, charging his unroll. A nice play to get Hardy in the three up, three down inning for Sturdivant. Now we're through five in Sarasota. We are tied. Tampa Bay 7 the 7 
Well, 7-7 seven, seven game, five home runs combined in this game. There is Soon Soo Kim, who is uh, certainly in the mix to start in left field. And, uh, Brian, here's the possibilities. Nolan Reimold, of course, in camp, having a tough spring at the plate, 167. Joey Rickard is the Rule 5 pick from Tampa Bay. He's having an outstanding spring. And then Christian Walker added to the mix, although he's only played in left field once here in Florida. There is talk that he will become an everyday outfielder. He may have to go back to AAA uh, to learn the fine points of playing the outfield. But uh, there again, there's choices. And uh, there's uh, Joey Rickard there. It looks like that he's going to make the team as the fourth outfielder because of his defensive skills. Well, yeah, this is one of the few spots that is still kind of up for grabs. And I know as a staff, they want to see somebody grab the bull by the horns and run with it. You don't want to necessarily default to somebody because everybody else was worse than you. So uh, we're starting to see Kim swing the bat certainly a lot better over the last seven games. Rickards had a very good spring. Um, you know, Christian Walker, I think they're going to need to send him down to get some more playing time in the outfield first. Uh, but it's going to be an interesting situation to see how it plays out over these last 11 games. Loney bounces it to Hardy in the shift. Loney was trying to get Manny to move. He, he was motioning. Manny was halfway between third and second. And he said, come on, move a little that way. Move a little that way. Oh, the shift plays a lot of mind games on guys. Makes you think about a lot of things that you don't want to think about while you're at the plate, I'm sure. Rene Rivera, he's 0 for 2. He's flat out and grounded out. Bill McFarland sent out for a second inning of work after the long fifth inning. That ball's crushed to center field for Rivera. Little one off single for Tampa Bay. Nice piece of hitting right there by Rivera. Got a sinker that stayed up, stayed on it, didn't get out in front of it, didn't roll over it, drove it right back up the middle for a base hit. That is the key when you're facing a sinker ball pitcher is to stay through the middle, stay the other way, so that it doesn't turn into a, a lazy ground ball to the pull side. That is the uh, that is the one thing that guys really try to emphasize when you face somebody throwing a good sinker. Here's Riley Unrow, one of the uh, extra players brought up for today's game. You see, uh, veteran pitchers, veteran catchers become very aware when guys come off the bench with no name on the back and high numbers and a lot of times they're coming up there ready to swing and they want to ambush a good first pitch change up there right there by T.J. McFarland, trying to stay away from that ambush. Bouncer towards the hole. Tough play for Hardy. Backhand fires out there. Back to first, not in time. What a play by Hardy. Terrific play by J.J. You're starting to see his health and the way that he's moving and the energy that he's bringing. Bobby Dickerson talked about it earlier. He looks as healthy as he's looked in several years. Scope makes a great turn with that arm strength, makes it as close as you can make it, but Unroe gets down the line pretty well. This is a team that's going to turn a lot of double plays when you look at the arm strength of Jonathan at second base, uh, the way that Manny can range to his left and his right, and the arm strength that he has to get it to second base in a hurry. Those are the hardest double plays to turn. Um, are the five four threes and the three six ones and things like that so but this team can can do it all they can turn it from every different direction Armanda Ariza will come off the bench he's one of the three catchers brought here today this is Morrison's spot the DH nice block by Caleb Joseph another first pitch breaking ball from TJ Somebody coming off the bench ready to swing. He's not going to give up that that double or that home run on that first pitch. So I think give him a little different look to begin with and then try to go back to that sinker, the one that he wants to make his living with. This is encouraging that McFarland, who sat out a, a stretch with a sore elbow, is able to come back for a second inning after getting back in game action on Wednesday. Yeah, this is a guy that's important. When we talk about organizational depth, uh, TJ is one of those guys that is extremely important because he can go multiple innings. He can pitch in lots of different situations, get righties and lefties out. So we see a soft liner to left. Right off the end of the bat for Ariza. So two hits in the inning. TJ's had some bad luck so far today. A lot of balls hit, but not a lot of hit hard. And the one that was hit hard went for a grand slam. So 
Uh, that, that's the tough part about pitching is you, you can't control the results sometimes, but he's making fairly quality pitches. Left that one sinker up to Souza who hit it out of the ballpark, but a lot of good pitches so far by TJ today. There's Kane Wong. Breaking ball for a strike. Good pitch. Chaz Rowe now getting loose for the O's. Mike Griffin, the AAA pitching coach, is out there with the relievers. You saw Dom Sheedy on the bench with Dave Wallace. And Dom is in the bullpen. With the extra staff here. Dom can stay on the bench and have some caucus time with uh, Dave Wallace about what they're seeing. There they are. Ron Johnson, the AAA manager, is still here, as is Mike Griffin, the pitching coach. I don't know if Kai Wong is related to Colton Wong, but it sure looks like it. His stance, his swing, everything he's got going on. Uh, either he mimics himself or they might be brothers. Look at this ball. Served the other way on an 0-2 pitch. And Tampa Bay is going to get the lead. TJ is just, uh, it's not his day to, to get the easy outs. Another kind of soft liner that finds a hole somewhere, costs him another run. He's really making good pitches. Uh, this is a sinker that runs in on the lefty. Wong, it kind of fights it off, fists it out down the left field line for an RBI single. Uh, as a pitcher, a, a guy like TJ, you just try not to get frustrated. You try not to get discouraged. Just keep making your pitches and realize that it's not always about results. It's about the process sometimes and coming off an injury. This is just part of the process for him is getting out there and getting his work. There's still two down in the inning. Or Dickerson getting another plate appearance. He may have uh, requested to stay in the game. As he's not only over three, he has struck out all three times. Yeah, sometimes you don't want to leave on that note with three, over three with three punch outs. And then he also may want to see a lefty. You know, sometimes in spring training, I know as a switch hitter, sometimes I didn't see enough from one side of the plate or the other. And then all of a sudden, our lefty comes in. You say, wait a minute, I need one more at bat. I want to see a lefty. Uh, I haven't seen one in a week. So that may be part of this process as well that he's trying to get ready and see. Uh, see somebody throwing from the left side of, of the mound. The one on one to count on Dickerson. Well, the good news for McFarland is this is the 13th batter that he's faced, so he's certainly getting the work in. And you can see his frustration a little bit right there when uh, Caleb Joseph threw the ball back to him. He threw a very good slider. Caleb threw the ball back to him. He kind of snatched it. Uh, very easy to get frustrated when the results don't match what you're doing. Uh, and he is throwing the ball well, and the results aren't matching up. So hopefully make a good pitch right here and get out of this. And a foul tip held by Caleb. Dickerson thought that ball hit the dirt. 0 for 4 with four strikeouts for Dickerson. Hey, Brian, time for a snack.
Well, opening day in Birdland now just two weeks away from tomorrow. So get ready now for the upcoming season by securing your spot with an Orioles full or partial season plan. Season plan members enjoy exclusive ticket savings. You get MLB's most flexible exchange policy, priority access to postseason tickets, and access to tickets for Orioles opening day. So don't miss an inning of the excitement. Visit Orioles.com slash season or call 888-848-BIRD. Left field, that is Grandin Getzman, who is now in the game. Casey Gillespie is at first base. And Nick Kiofo is behind the plate. Here's Jonathan Scope. And he'll take it low. Strike on the corner. Jonathan Sturdivant stays in there. Jonathan with a fly ball to right today. Ground ball to third. He's looking for something to drive right here. In a 1-1 county scene, two breaking balls, probably hoping for a heater. He got the heater. He just didn't get it where he wanted it. He got it in the back instead of the middle of the plate. That's never what you want in spring training, certainly from a managerial standpoint. You want to—you don't want to see your guys getting hit, especially up there. Fastball that just kind of gets away from him and runs up and in and hits Jonathan right in the back. Hopefully it caught more meat than bone. And Julio Borbone, who's over from minor league camp today, is going to come on a pinch run for Jonathan. It's Julio, veteran, uh, back with the Orioles. Played at AAA Norfolk last year. Here's Caleb Joseph. There's a the strike. Caleb having a nice day today. Two for two. Two singles, an RBI, a run. A couple of really good at bats. Battled with two strikes. Drove in a, a run with two outs. Looking to keep his good day going with another knock. Second inning of work for Sturdivant. And Shufo now in there behind the plate. So a new catcher for him. Oh. Off speed pitch for a strike going two. Well, the good news for the O's today, Chris Tillman had four good innings. He allowed three runs on five hits. Back-to-back -back home runs in the third drove in all three of the runs. Runner goes, pitches take a low throw, is off the bag, and there's Port Bowen. And Buck Showalter was talking about that yesterday. Port Bowen actually was in the starting lineup at Port Charlotte. He let off the game and flied out. Then Reimold struck out, and then the Reigns came. But his stolen base ability is something they really love. This is something that Bourbon provides. Uh, depth in the minor league, depth in your roster that uh, if someone were to get hurt or go down, he provides that experience, and he can do a lot of different things. He's explosive on the base pass, as we saw right there. He got a great jump on a breaking ball in the dirt, uh, able to get into scoring position with nobody out. Now we see if Caleb Joseph can have a really good situational at bat. Even though he's got two strikes, see what he tries to do here to, to move uh, Bourbon over to third. Tried to go that way, and he fouled it off. He did. You could see the intent of his swing, even though it was a fastball almost running down and in on him. Caleb was very intentional about trying to get that ball to the right side. Uh, being down one here, eight to seven in the, in the sixth inning, you want to try and get that guy to third with less than two outs. Or bone a veteran and has had major league experience, mostly with Texas. In the dirt, knocked down by Shufo. Nicely done. Just in the game, and he's challenged. This is a terrific block. This is a breaking ball that goes about 50 feet. And he's able to just get over and get in front of it, take it off the left shoulder. He gets his body squared back to the mound to try and deflect the ball back towards the infield. Uh, terrific play right there behind the plate to keep that tie and run from moving up from second to third base. And Caleb again showing uh, patience at the plate, not chasing that pitch. 
Another good take on a 2-2 slider that, that broke just off the outside corner. Caleb really looks good. He looks calm. Uh, all these things that we talk about where the game is slowing down and uh, Caleb looks like he's there and he's ready and that's a good sign especially if Matt Wieters is not going to be ready to start the season possibly. So a full count on Caleb with Manny on deck. Goes down by a run in the sixth. And he got him. Tough slider right there. Caleb uh, battled his way through that at bat. And then Sturdivant makes a, a, a just a pitcher's pitch here on a 3-2 slider down on the knee high on the black on the outside corner. Caleb tries to stay on it and do something with it. It's just one of those pitches that uh, in that at-bat, the pitcher makes a better pitch than you made a better swing. So uh, now it's up to Manny to come up here and drive this guy in from second base. Manny's had a good day. He has singled. He has walked. He has scored. One for two officially. He's also flied out. On this uh, hazy day with glare, see Manny with the sunglasses on. Try to get a better view of that pitch coming in. The sun is now behind the clouds in Sarasota, but it is hazy. sun goes down you can get that glare when you're at the plate and you just feel like all you're doing is squinting and uh, it's tough to get a tough to get a good visual sometimes and so Manny going up there with the glasses today you can just see how kind of overcast but that sun's peeking through those white clouds and making it really tough to see Bouncer Bourbon will go to third and play the first by Beckham gets him so two down and Bourbon ends up at third base. Two down, but good base running by Bourbon. Allows you to put yourself uh, 90 feet closer to home plate and, and, and provides more ways for you to be able to score with two outs. Uh, if you were to just stay there at second base, you have to have a base hit to score you. You see him, he gets a really good read off the bat. Usually what they say when you take your secondary, if you see the ball hit and it's on your left shoulder, then you go to third. If it's on your right shoulder in front of you, you stay put. That one was one of those in-between ones where it's right at him, but he had a great read, takes off to third, puts himself in a really good position to score on a wild pitch or an error or something like that. Pedro Alvarez lays off a breaking ball down and in. See the shift on on Pedro. And with the shift on, you'll see Bourbon. He'll get probably 30 feet down the third baseline uh, because there's nobody over there to keep him close. So it won't take much for him to get to home plate on a ball that's in the dirt. And another good take, 2-0. and oh. Pedro has already tried once bunting against the shift. He did it the other day, but he bunted it straight back to the pitcher. So. It's something that you see worked on a lot in spring training and uh, and the big guys they get frustrated when they give away an at bat So I don't think you'll see it quite as much as you think in the in the season great swing here That ball is driven to left field and Getzman has it go sail over his head Bourbon scores to tie the game and Pedro Alvarez at second base with a double and his fifth RBI No punt there So he's got a home run and he's got an RBI and a five RBI game. These are two great swings today. Another ball on the outside corner. You see him get his foot down, his weight stays back, the hands stay behind the ball, and he's able to drive a short hop off the wall in left center field. We saw the grand slam, almost the exact same place, but about 40 feet farther earlier in the game. This is something that the Orioles love to see is Pedro Alvarez staying on the ball, driving it the other way and providing the power that they were hoping they'd get when they signed him. Alfredo Marte comes on as a pinch runner for Pedro, and here's Adam Jones. And he'll take low 1 0. Well, I said that I wasn't sure that Pedro Alvarez would end up in that two hole, but he's looking pretty good in that spot right now. Well, what it also does is it, it splits the lineup. You have a righty leading off in Manny, then the lefty in Alvarez, then the righty Jones, then the lefty Davis, then the righty Trumbo, and the lefty Kim. 
And you know, the farther you move a guy like Pedro down on the lineup, the less protection he may have when you get down towards that 7-8 hole or whatever. And, and, and Pedro's a scary hitter, so if you have somebody behind him, say like an Adam Jones, you can't just fiddle around with Pedro. You're going to have to go at him, and you're seeing what he can do when he gets pitches to hit. There he is with his good friend and college teammate, Ryan Flaherty. Well, Pedro had two hits in his first five games, and he's got two hits in this game. Little Vanderbilt Commodores over there in the dugout. Sky the right field out there is Sousa. And he's got it for the final out. But another two-out RBI hit as Alvarez comes through. We are tied, Eddie. There's a lot. A lot of offense in this game. We are tied at eight. The Rays with 11 hits. The Orioles have 10. Here's Chaz Rowan for the O's as we head to the seventh. Chaz Rowe, the big 6-5 righty. You see last year, 36 games, 4-2 four and two record, 4.14 ERA. Sinker slider guy. Got off to a really good start. Threw the ball extremely well in the middle of the year. Uh, ended up with a little injury. Came back. Couldn't quite seem to uh, find that rhythm again. Uh, but somebody I think that uh, could really make an impact in this bullpen this year and he's out of options Which is going to make a, a decision for the Orioles staff first ball swinging is Souza And Flaherty tested right away and a nice pick on the back end by Christian Walker and Mark Trumbull joining us from out beyond the um, Orioles bullpen uh, I, I, I gotta believe you like hanging curveballs Sometimes it plays all right um, Today was a pretty good example. You know, you get, way, you know, you could be buried in that count, but uh, if they do you a favor, stay short enough, and you can maybe get a little, a uh, little bit of barrel on it. Yeah, Mark, that was a great swing. Uh, certainly, you get into 0-2 count, you start to think uh, I might be in a little bit of trouble. But you know, looking at you coming over here, um, I know you've moved organizations before, but anytime you change organizations, it is tough to kind of get in the rhythm, get in the flow, get to know guys, really feel comfortable. Do you feel like? Uh, recently, you're really starting to get to that place within this organization. Yeah, you kind of know when it starts feeling like home. Um, I think I'm fortunate that I've had spring training as opposed to trying to do it mid-season. But um, right, you know, it just it feels natural now, and that's kind of what you want. You just you want to take kind of the uh, new guy at school factor out of it. You want to feel like you belong. You know, you kind of have some inside jokes and uh, get to know some of the guys a little bit better. Now, Mark, uh, I know some players feel like uh, they're set for opening day. And uh, they'd like to get out of here and uh, get to play in the major league stadiums and games that count. Uh, but uh, you said something interesting yesterday that you feel like you still have a couple of things to work on down here, and you're glad there's more games. Well, the reality is we're going to be here for a little, while, uh, a little bit longer. But um, you know, I, I would like to see. I saw a nice, uh, you know, the last guy threw a cutter. I haven't seen a ton of those. 
um, you know, the power sinker, all those pitches that you're going to see during the season, uh, you'd like to at least get a little bit of a look here um, to kind of know where you're at on them. Uh, and that's kind of what I meant by that. I didn't mean I wanted to be here for another couple months. But, uh, you know, just just a couple more looks, then we'll get ready to go. So, so you're not going to become a resident, you're telling us. <laughs> you know, that's not the plan right now. <laughs> yeah, I was telling Jim, you know, it, it, you get to this point in spring training, and it's really about kind of checking off those last few boxes. And you made a good point there of seeing a cutter, seeing some different things. Are there things that you still want to check off? Are there still boxes? Uh, whether it be defensively or offensively, making the move to right field more consistently, things like that. What are you looking to do? Sure. I, I think I've got to lay off a few of those breaking balls. I'm still chasing a bit, not recognizing it early enough. Uh, the last couple of days have been better. Um, on defense, uh, maybe throwing um, throwing the bases just a little bit more, especially in-game. haven't had a chance to, to really try and cut anybody down yet, so that would be nice. And uh, just more reads overall. Um, you know, right field something I, I'm not as new as most people probably think I am to it, but uh, the more the more the better, um, you know, for the long haul. All right, well, Mark, we appreciate the visit. Uh, congratulations on a big day, and thanks so much for joining us. Cool, thanks, guys. Well, the fans are joining their seventh inning stretch at Smith Stadium in Sarasota. We head to the bottom of the seventh in an 8-8 game and welcome into our broadcast booth. Jim Hutzer with the new guy, Brian Roberts, who has joined our Masson family today and you're settling in very nicely. You enjoying it? Yeah, it's been great. You know, it's nice to see the game from another side every now and then and it's different, but uh, I have a ton of respect for what these guys do and it's, um, you know, and more respect for what you do now, that's for sure. <laughs> well, we know how fast the game is on the field. You certainly know that better than I do. And the farther you get away, it slows down, doesn't it? <laughs> That's what they say, and I think they're right, yeah, in a lot of ways. <laughs> yeah, you, you really have to be conscious about realizing that uh, it is still fast down there. Even though it looks a little bit slower up here, um, I can see how it, how it happens that it becomes uh, uh, that people think uh, you're a lot better than you were, that's for sure. <laughs> now, what are your impressions of what you've seen as the Orioles uh, as they try to come along here? Tomorrow's their only day off. Today's the end of the third week of games. Uh, how do they look to you? I think they look great. I think uh, offensively we saw today a lot of really good things. You're seeing Pedro Alvarez uh, starting to get locked in and comfortable. Mark Trumbull hitting a home run. Um, and I, I really liked what I saw from Chris Toman today. I thought he I thought he pitched confidently. I thought uh, he attacked the zone. I thought he used the pitches that he was talking about using the curveball and the cutter uh, better than he has. So I think they're taking some really good positives from today. The other thing I'm impressed with uh, on your scorecard, you do have all the changes and every team has changed every position. <laughs> Way to keep up. And here's Ryan Garten coming on the pitch. Ryan Garten we see last season in double A, 41 games with a 6-1 and one record, 2.95 ERA. Uh, 61 innings pitch drafted by the Rays in the 34th round out of Florida Atlantic good minor league numbers um, and we're gonna see him face Ryan Flaherty right off the uh, bat here and Ryan first ball swinging swings through it the shortstop is Willie Adams 
And that's Brian Jackson in right field. Good change up off of the fastball that he threw by by Ryan on the first pitch. Get in this 0-2 count, you just try to battle. You just try to get a pitch that you can put in play. He's seen it all now. He's seen a fastball first pitch, change up second pitch, and a breaking ball on the third. So it makes you feel at least a little bit more comfortable that you've seen most of his repertoire in three pitches. Ryan is in Chris Davis's spot in the Orioles lineup. Another foul ball. Ryan is such a valuable asset to this team. Being able to play all over the field, multiple positions, and be able to play them well, not just go out there and play them. You know, you're talking about a guy who hit a home run and playing five different positions last year. It's just a, an asset that not every team has, and he's extremely valuable. Fights it off to stay alive. Well, he is the, uh, the versatility on this team. And the rumor is he's also the emergency catcher. It's never been, con <laughs> never been confirmed. And he got him. So Garton, after a few foul balls, gets Flaherty to strike out. Well, he saw about everything he had, but this was the one pitch he hadn't seen yet was the, more of a slider. He saw the fastball, the changeup, and the curveball before. You know, when you come off the bench and you get 0-2 right away, it makes it a tough A-B, especially in the seventh inning when you've been sitting around all day. But uh, Ryan's had a phenomenal spring training so far. Uh, good to see him swinging the bat the way that he has early in spring. Well, speaking of swinging the <laughs> bat, how about 14 RBIs to lead the team for Christian Walker? Well, not only does he lead the team, you're talking about second in the American League in spring training and slugging percentage, tied for first in home runs with four and RBIs with 14. Uh, this is a guy who came in and said, I'm going to I'm going to leave my footprint on this spring training. I'm going to make an impression. And he has certainly done that so much so that they tried to change gloves for him. And that probably will go forward. But as we mentioned earlier, uh, Dan Duquette on the uh, Hot Stove Radio Show the other night indicated that, that if the switch is made permanent, that he may need AAA time in the outfield to, to learn the nuances of the position. Yeah, and I think so. I mean, uh, it, as we see a, another very good pitch, quality fastball at 92 miles an hour on the black. Uh, but, you know, there's a there's a slight roadblock at first base, and, uh, and Christian Walker's path to the big leagues might be left field. He was put in a tough spot right there, a pitch that may be just off the corner on the outside, too close to take. Obviously, Will Little rings him up. Um, but Ryan, Ryan Flaherty, Christian Walker, you see the two strikeouts have both had a, a terrific spring already. Here's Dario Alvarez, who's in the game now in right field. And in the dirt. You know, people don't realize it's not easy to just pick up and move a position. It's not easy to just switch from first base to outfield or outfield to infield. Uh, it takes a lot of work, and we've seen that uh, even though Mark Trumbo said he's played more right field than maybe people think, as we see a fly ball out to left center, carrying pretty well. Yeah, Call out the lead. morning track. Yep, he runs it down, so Garton comes on, and it's a three-up, three-down inning. We are through seven in Sarasota. O's and Rays are tied at eight.
presented by authority of the Baltimore Orioles and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form. And the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without the express written consent of the Baltimore Orioles. So we're tied in eight. Total of 21 hits in this game. The O's have the only error. And as we go to the eighth, here comes the O's closer on for in any of work, Zach Britton. As we see, Zach last year, just a phenomenal year. 64 games, uh, 1.92 ERA. Third in the American League with 36 saves. Made his first all-star appearance. He's just got that heavy, heavy sinker, uh, which led to a 80% ground ball percentage, which was tops among all major league relievers. He has just settled into this closer role, and I don't believe he's going to relinquish it anytime soon. This is uh, Casey Gillespie getting his first at-bat. Casey Gillespie last season in A ball 250. Good power numbers with 17 home runs, 48 RBIs. Now Zach has had such a good spring. There was some uh, kidding going on in the clubhouse the other day that uh, don't peak too soon. And the other day, in fact, uh, he was sent to the minor league camp so he could pitch a couple of innings at a couple of dominant innings there against a ball players and what was impressive is after the appearance he hung out at Twin Lakes Park stayed on the bench visited with the minor leaguers any suggestions uh, that he made he, he did willingly shook hands and made the minor leaguers feel that they are in fact part of the organization I, I thought it was real classy on Zach's part to do that he didn't just get his work in and bolt Zach is one of the classiest humblest guys you'll be around uh, you know he went through some ups and downs so he knows that it's not always roses in this game and it's it's going to be hard and getting to the top and getting to where he is now uh, was not a foregone conclusion at any point uh, until a couple years ago so great to see him doing that for those young guys down there providing them with some wisdom and uh, making them feel comfortable within the organization from the top down 2-2 two, two is a little low and you think back to a couple of seasons ago where Zach had to make the team because he was out of options. He wasn't going to crack the rotation, so he was in the bullpen, and Tommy Hunter was the closer to begin that year, and he had some struggles, so Zach was tested, and uh, the rest is history. And there's a strikeout of Gillespie and one away. Yeah, Gillespie, I'm not sure there's a lot of guys in A-ball that have seen stuff like this too often. Here's 95, 96, 97 with Turbo Sink coming at you, and and uh, that is tough to hit at any level, but it's certainly tough to hit when you haven't been above A-ball. Uh, maybe not necessarily a fair challenge at times. I know one of the things that I was talking to Zach in the outfield today, um, and, and the way that he has thrown the ball so well, I said, are, you, are there things that you're trying to work on? And he said, I am working on, on my breaking ball some. I've thrown it more than I have in the past this spring. Uh, and I've really been trying to work on the sinker to the inside part of the plate on righties. And, um, and that can be a pitch that is, is just devastating to righties because with his sink, it starts in off the plate and they give up on it. So it'll be interesting to see how he utilizes those two pitches, uh, not, not just today, but as he moves forward into the season. Shufo fouls it back. Owen won the count. Another foul ball. Pitch is so hard to square up. I've seen it from both sides, and it's not fun either way, <laughs> from the field or the batter's box. And uh, it's good for uh, good for some of these young kids coming off the bench here to to see what a big league closer really looks like. No, no two pitch to Shufo, and he got him. Blew up by him at 96. Well, usually he wants his ball to move down in the zone. That one stayed up a little bit. You see him with his finger saying, man, he wanted that to go down. But with that kind of velocity, left on left, up around letter high, belt high, it is just so tough to catch up to. That's not where he wants to make his living, that's for sure. Uh, but against a lefty, you have a little better chance up there than against a righty, probably. Here's Riley Unroe, who bats for a second time. Zach gets that sinker by him. That's where he wants to make his living. That's the one that starts about thigh high and just dives off the table, finishes more like shin high. And it is just so hard to square that up or do anything with it. Right there, first strike. So he has command of his pitches, no doubt about that.
Unruh last year played at Bowling Green. And then a three pitch strikeout. So Britain comes on. Three up, three down on three strikeouts as the Rays go in order. Bottom of the eighth coming up. It is a tie game at eight. There's a lot to say. Orioles Spring Training Baseball is live with the MLB.com at bat app. You can stay connected all spring with radio broadcasts, video highlights, stats, news, and more. Download MLB.com at bat, the number one app for live baseball on your smartphone and tablet. Another sellout here, 8,405, and here is Parker Markle, who's coming on the pitch for the Rays. Yeah, we've seen Parker Markle last season in the minor league split between double-A and triple-A, 47 games, 5-3 and three record with 3.43 ERA. Uh, works with a little sinker, fastball, slider, and a changeup. Uh, has had some problems with his command. Walked 31 guys in 60 innings last year. If he could get that command a little bit better, his stuff can play, I think, certainly at the big league level. They go to work on Paul Yanish, who is batting for a first time. Paul took over for J.J. Hardy at shortstop. 267 in the spring. Shows Bunk with the third baseman Wong playing deep. Paul Yanish, another one of those guys who brings a lot of versatility and a lot of depth to this team, certainly at the shortstop position. Uh, Plays defense extremely well. Gives you quality at bats. Worked himself into a nice 2-0 hitters count here. Looking for something to drive. Maybe take the lead. Orioles tied it in the bottom of the sixth on the double by Alvarez. Center field. There's Lee. And he's got it for the out. One away. With the Rays playing their home games during the season in St. Petersburg, which is just outside of Tampa, a lot of their fans come here to Sarasota to see them play when they play here because it's closer than going all the way down to Port Charlotte. So you, you definitely feel a, a bit of a Rays presence here today. Certainly not as much as the O's fans, but... And here's Bourbon to pinch hit for scope and stays in. Down the line and foul. Mm. If Bourbon can find a way to work his way on base and get his speed on there and try to create a run here in the bottom of the eighth. We've already seen him steal a base today. Got a great jump at first, so if he can get on, it can create some havoc. On the third base side with foul. Bourbon is now 30 years old. He's from the Dominican Republic, but he came to America and went to college at the University of Tennessee. 
And he was the Rangers' first round pick out of Tennessee in 2007. And he was in the big leagues by 2009. His last big league appearance was in 2013 with the Cubs. Buck Showalter loves having him in the organization. He is a big time insurance, especially defensively. And you have to have those guys in your system that have big league experience. You're talking about someone who's who's been a top prospect and, and been on those lists and now realizes he's a, he's just trying to find a way back to the big leagues and contribute. The last two years for AAA Norfolk, this is his third consecutive year with the O's. He has had 34 stolen bases and then last year 23. That's a valuable threat, as we've seen as well. Even if you just get deep into September or the or uh, even the postseason, you know, teams are using guys and taking up a roster spot just for somebody who can come in late in the game and pinch run, steal a base, provide that um, that other dynamic to your lineup and to your team. So uh, the speed speed never goes into a slump, as they say, and it will, it will always be valuable. Well, one and two, the count. And a good take. And you see so often, uh, especially in the early rounds of postseason, where teams will add a player who may not have played a lot, if at all, with them all year, if he could offer that particular skill. Can you come off the bench late in the game and possibly help us steal a run? Well, the ultimate example was Dave Roberts, right? And the... Mm -hmm. Uh, with the Red Sox helping them win that first World Series, stealing that base in the in the ninth inning, so it's a valuable asset, and it's something that teams uh, uh, definitely recognize the need for. That stolen base worked out so well. He's now a manager. <laughs> Three and two on Bourbon, and he drew a walk. Good at bat there by Julio. Just find a way to get on base in a tie game in the bottom of the eighth inning when. When speed is your uh, your biggest asset, you just got to get to first base, and now we'll see if he can get himself a jump and get on the move here and get to second base, get in scoring position for L.J. Hose. L.J. batting for the first time. He's in Caleb's spot, the number nine spot in the lineup. L.J. spring stats, 217, 5 for 23. Getting a chance here to come up with a with a big RBI if, if Julio can get into scoring position over there. He doesn't go on the pitch upstairs. Parker Markle looks like he's pretty quick to the plate. You can see the slide step in action there. Something that has come into play more and more and Buck Showalter's a huge fan of and uh, is a big point of emphasis for the pitching staff for the Orioles is, is giving your catcher that chance to throw somebody out. Pitch on the corner. LJ turned 26 on March the 5th. Back in the Orioles organization, they purchased this contract from the Astros in November. And then he was designated for assignment and then re-signed as a non-roster player. He has a, a foundation that helps children in the Baltimore Washington area he he's from Bowie and uh, he had a toy drive in December that was well attended and he raised thousands of dollars worth of toys for kids LJ is a really classy young man obviously grew up in the Baltimore area as you were as you said and I had a chance to spend a lot of time with him over the years uh, coming up through the minor as he was coming up through the minor leagues and being in spring training and then being in the big leagues as well and uh, has a great heart for for kids in the community as you just talked about as well as you know wanting to make his impact and make his impression uh, and have an opportunity to play at the big league level some more well, one and two the count on him with Bourbon on it first too tight it was an emotional thing for LJ when he got shipped over to the oh, Astros sure. you know this was a hometown kid coming up and having the opportunity to play for his hometown team and I know that that was tough on him. Well, Bone gets back.
You know, Ron Johnson's going to have uh, a challenge at Norfolk this year. There seems to be about eight outfielders <laughs> that they head to that team. And if Christian Walker becomes an outfielder, there's another one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the hard part about, um, I think, managing in AAA as much as anything is, for one, all the all the movement of guys up and down from the big leagues year, um, week in and week out. And Ron Johnson does an incredible job down there. I had an opportunity to be around him some on a rehab stint. And, and he's just one of those guys that is able to get the best out of his players, but also realize the situation and know that there's going to be a lot of movement and there's going to be a lot of moving parts. LJ drives one deep to center. Well, Bone was running on the pitch. He bluffs as he gets back to tag. So look at that bat there for LJ Hose, who fell behind, worked it full, and then flies out. That was a good at bat right there by LJ. Got a pitch to drive. It's what you want to see. You want to see uh, in this situation, you try to look for something up in the zone that you can maybe get an extra base hit and get Bourbon on the run and try to take the lead here in the bottom of the eighth. Well, two down now. Steve Tollison for his first at bat. Marco's got to be careful here. He's got the uh, good fastball, and Tollison, <laughs> he thrives. You talk about bat speed. <laughs> Steve loves the heater, and uh, we've seen it from uh, both sides being on the same team and then watching him on another team. And he's the kind of guy that you don't want to leave a first pitch heater in there, that's for sure. And I think they know that. There's the, the bender that <laughs> gets in there. Now he's in the hole and two. You just got to battle. This is those times where you haven't, maybe you haven't seen the guy before. And now you're in a hole oh and two. You just try to be as still and calm as possible. Let the ball travel. Fight off the tough pitches until maybe you can get something that you can put in play and, uh, and just have a competitive at bat. Or Bone drawing a lot of attention from Markle. And to me, this is one of those times where Bourbon, you might want to just take a chance. You're in an 0-2 count. You're in a hole 0-2 with two outs. Uh, you got a tie game. There's nothing to lose. I'd try to get in a scoring position. If you get thrown out, then at least Tolly gets to start off with a fresh count next time off. And, um, so this is one of those times where I think you might just take a shot. He does not go, and the pitch is off the plate, one and two. Steve Tollison now 32 years old. He's had parts of four major league seasons. The past two years, he was in the Blue Jays organization, but was part of that wild card run with the Orioles in 2012. Had some big hits that year coming off the bench. I remember the home runoff Cliff Lee in the internet. I remember that, yes. That was at Camden Yards on a Saturday afternoon. That, that kind of reminded me of Early in my career with the Orioles, when uh, there's Brian Mattis getting loose and Jeff Rebele was the utility man. And in the playoffs against Seattle, Davey Johnson started him against Randy uh -huh. Johnson. Hey, go get him, Major yeah. League. Yeah, just, just face that guy. You know, but and you have those guys. Tall, Steve's the Rebele same way. You know? Yeah. And, and Steve was that way with the guys like Sabathia and that sort of thing, too. I remember him having really good at-bats against Sabathia. And, um, you know, just professional at-bats and loves lefties that throw hard. He's worked himself back even in the count now, though. He's at two and two. Now maybe he can get a pitch he can drive. Or Bone extending his lead a bit. He is not running. Foul back this way. Tollison played in college at South Carolina. He is a native of South Carolina from Roebuck. Pro since 05. Markle's from California, Newport Beach. I hear it's nice there. That's what they say. Or <laughs> <laughs> Bone runs and the pitch is inside, throw to second, not in time. Two steals in the game for Bourbon. So now basic to get the O's the lead because of this. And he finally got the high leg kick from Markle. He'd been slide-stepping him most of the at-bat. 
Marco got to the count where he knew he needed to focus more on Tolleson as the hitter. He gave him the high leg kick where Bone was ready for it. Got a great jump, puts himself in scoring position here with a 3-2 count and two outs. Great at bat so far by Tolleson and good patience by Bourbon to get a pitch that he could run on. So three and two with two down. And he got it. Oh, what a breaking ball that was. So Tolleson swings through it. Bourbon left stranded. Well, that's of the night. Mattis coming on in the tie game. Well, we have an eight-game eight as we go to the ninth. 21 hits in this game, but none of those hits off Orioles closer Zach Britton there. Zach, three up, three down on three strikeouts. Uh, somebody in the clubhouse was kidding, Zach. Uh, you know, it's not regular season. That save, save those outs for, for April back home. Yeah, you know, just trying to go out there and pound the strikes out. So uh, strikeouts aren't uh, necessarily what I'm looking for, but... Um... If anything, you're looking for the hitter's reactions. And today I got some pretty bad swings, which is telling me it's doing what it needs to do. Outs are good anytime, right, Zach? Right, yeah. Any <laughs> out, any out, whether it's a ground ball or a strikeout, I'll take it anyway. That's, it. that's right. I know we talked uh, in the outfield a little bit earlier today. Uh, on, on some of the things that you're working on, concentrating on in spring training, that you've focused a little bit more on the breaking ball as well as trying to throw the sinker on the inside half to the righty. Um, what, what are you trying to accomplish when you're working on those things in spring training? I think the biggest thing is um, the command of it for me, especially the breaking ball is in a pitch that hitters are really going to commit to quite often. You know what I'm throwing majority of the time. So for me, that's a command pitch. It's not something I can throw in the dirt and get away with. So working on that, and then obviously sinkers inside. Uh, when you got a guy, you know, looking out over the plate, as you know, as a hitter, if, if you stay in one spot as a pitcher, you're going to look uh, out over the plate. So just throw some sinkers inside on some righties and back them off the plate a little bit. Well, the thing that's interesting about your repertoire, your sinker is so effective. Obviously, you use that the majority of the time. But when you get the, those certain lefties and they're looking for that, you snap off that big breaking ball. That's a very effective pitch. Yeah, it's, uh, it's shown to be effective. It's just a matter of knowing when to do it. Uh, knowing the situation and obviously the hitter you don't want to throw something to their bat speed when they're looking fast so uh, when I throw it I got to execute it and I think that's the biggest thing that I'm working on is uh, it might come a handful of times throughout the season but when I throw it I need to execute it and that's what I'm working on. Zach do you find it tough uh, kind of on a day like today where you came in and you face three guys that you you'll you know you've never seen before and you won't see in the big leagues this year during spring training, does that get frustrating at all for you, or is it hard to judge kind of where you are when you're facing guys that are hitting an A ball and things like that, as opposed to uh, maybe seeing the Longorias and the uh, Lonies and those guys? Uh, how do you deal with kind of that sort of thing and, and assess what you're doing? Yeah, definitely. I feel like I, I got to hold myself uh, accountable a little bit more so when I'm facing those guys rather than, you know, the heart of their everyday lineup. Um, so I look at the action of the pitches and swings. I, I think with movement, as long as it's moving and guys are hitting into the ground, that's going to translate. Um, obviously, if they're hitting me pretty hard, that'd be a different story. But <laughs> sure. To me, I try to evaluate myself uh, 
a lot more so um, in making sure those were quality pitches. Are those pitches going to get guys out that I'm going to face every single day? Little Longoria's, Geyers, even you know, like Steve Pierce, so stuff like that. Um, guys that I'm going to see off the bench if I'm playing the race throughout the season. So um, I definitely got to go watch some video and make sure they're doing uh, what I wanted to do. Uh, but obviously, swing and misses and, and guys in the ball on the ground, I think that's going to translate uh, more so than if you know, guys are obviously hitting line drives. Uh, Zach, uh, your last appearance prior today, you were sent over to Twin Lakes to the minor league park to, so you could work two innings. Uh, it went very well, but, but tell me about after you came out of the game, how you stayed and mingled with all of the minor leaguers. Yeah, it's. Uh, I feel like those guys get forgotten quite a bit. And uh, I want to say every pitching coach that I had throughout the minors, it was there. And it was really cool to interact with them again. And, uh, you know, they helped me get to where I am. And I, I feel like uh, I want to let them know that I appreciate it. And, um, I think the biggest thing is when I was in the minors and I'd see a big league guy come down, it was nice when they would, you know, stop and, and say hi to me. And B-Rob was, was one of those guys that used to do that, and that stuck with uh, with me as a young player. So I make sure I go out of my way and talk to the guys they want to talk. They ask me questions. I stay there and answer them. Uh, I think that's important because these guys are Orioles. They're in our organization, and uh, you, know, you treat everyone with, with respect. And um, I think it goes a long way for those kids. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, Zach, you know, to make those guys feel comfortable. And, and for us, as uh, after being in the big leagues, it is a nice little wake-up call sometimes. Right. You go back over there, you remember where you came from and how hard it was to get to where you are. Uh, my last question would be, are there boxes still that you want to check off this spring? I know we, that's kind of the way I look at it. Is what's left on your agenda that you really want, want to kind of check off before you say, I'm ready to go? I think consistency, going out every day and, and feeling like I'm making good pitches. Uh, the sinker's doing what I want it to do consistently. I think that's the biggest thing for me to check right now because I know in, during the season I'm going to rely heavily on it. So the command and the movement, um, once I get that to where it's consistent pretty much every time out, uh, that's when I know I'm ready to go. How's the family doing? Uh, are you helping out? Yeah, it's been great. It's nice being down here. You know, we bought a home here, so it's nice to have everyone around and, and actually get to spend some more time at home throughout spring. Uh, and everything's going well. All right, well, Zach, we appreciate the visit. Keep it going, and uh, hey, save some of those punch-outs for opening day, okay? All right, sounds good. Thanks, guys. <laughs> okay. That's Zach Britton. And I, I, I love the, the story about the minor leagues where he made a point to go see every one of his minor league pitching coaches. Yeah, that that, that tells you the kind of character that, that Zach Britton possesses, and I think, uh, you know, I know that because I had an opportunity to be in a locker room with him and spend time with him, but for the fans and for other people to... To understand the, um, the nature of who these guys are as people, I think, is great. And that's a prime example right there. 3-0. And, oh, and Mattis gets a swinging strike. Bryant's first game appearance since March the 2nd. It's just the second appearance of the year. That, that lower back issue. Yeah, it's good to see Bryant out there through a bullpen on Wednesday. 38 pitches. I know it's nice to get out into some game action and really feel... Uh, like you're kind of part of the team again. So uh, he's found a niche really well in the bullpen. Uh, he's got good versatility. He can pitch against lefties and righties. Certainly dominated lefties last year, holding them to a 186 batting average again. So he's a really valuable asset to this bullpen, and they need him to be healthy. So two outs on a pop-up and a fly ball out. Center field for Bourbon. Oh, does he run it down? The three up, three down. Well, Zach Britton came on in the eighth. Nice enough to join us out there by the bullpen. And here's what he did. Casey Gillespie came up. And Casey Gillespie got that sinker. He swung through it. Then it was Nick Schofo. He swung through it. And then it was Riley Unruh. And he swung through it. Three up, three down on Case.
3,405 and a lot of youngsters. It was Little League Day here, so some of the Little League teams from Sarasota got to parade on the field and a lot of orange at Ed Smith Stadium. And the new pitcher for the Rays, Mark Sappington, big six foot five, 210 pounder, former fifth rounder by the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. In double A last year, 48 games, 3.69 ERA, 68 in a third inning, 71 strikeouts. Allowed only three home runs in those 68 innings, so obviously has quality stuff, possesses a power arm, and we're going to see a little bit of that here in the ninth inning. So he takes over for Markle, who goes one inning and no runs. The, the late inning relievers in this game have really dominated. There haven't been a whole lot of scoring since uh, those big innings there in the third, fourth, fifth. So Sappington will go to work on Alfredo Marte, who pinch ran for Pedro Alvarez. So he is in the DH spot batting second. Marte having a very good spring as well. Swinging the back, coming off the bench here, trying to get something going here in the bottom of the ninth, see if we can get a, they can get a rally going and, and walk him off. This is another player that Buck Showalter has come to really like. Marte came over from the Angels organization, spent most of last year in AAA, and he loves his approach to the game. Buck calls him a real professional at his craft. Well, you can see the quiet at bat already. Good takes for the first two pitches. Uh, you know, hitting two over 290 this spring. Uh, somebody that you, you really uh, keep an eye on and has made an impression certainly on the coaching staff and on Buck on the way that he goes about his business and the way that he takes his at bats. Fly ball right center field over is Jackson. And he's got it for the out and one away. And by the way, this game will end at the end of this half inning. So if the Orioles get a run, they'll walk it off. If not, it will be the Orioles' fourth tie. The Rays are now out of pitcher, although they do have somebody getting loose in the bullpen. It might be a, a minor leaguer what-if guy. Yeah, with their trip to Cuba tonight, they didn't bring a lot of their guys, I know, and uh, they're excited about that and a great opportunity for them. Joey Rickard coming to the plate. He has been uh, extremely good this spring. Another guy that has opened the eyes of Buck Showalter and the staff, batting 340 this spring. His versatility, his ability to play all three outfield positions and play them exceptionally well has been uh, very well received. Ooh, I got a piece of show foam. That hurts. And... Oh. Ooh. They don't get enough respect for what they do on a daily basis, Jim, that's for sure. And, uh, being around a guy like Matt Wieters as much as I have, and you, you just know the beating and the pounding that they take, and yet they go out there day after day and uh, are able to still do their job. It's really something that I respect a lot. And the breaking ball finds the plate. One and two on record. So you get smoked in the face with a foul ball, and then you, you got to go down in the dirt and take one off the arm or the ribs or wherever else. And it's, uh, you know, it just never stops back there behind the plate. You see him get in front of that one. It looked like it caught a piece of the elbow or the forearm. And there's going to be ice bags all over that body at some point uh, this evening. Another breaking ball there from Sappington. Good job by Rickard to foul it off, stay alive, give himself a chance to get on base for Flaherty hitting behind him. But Rickard is a, a unique athlete. He is completely ambidextrous. And he bats right-handed, but he throws left-handed. And if he makes the club and gets into a game, he'll be only the second position player in the history of the Orioles who bats left and throws right. You usually see a lot more, and it goes the opposite way, and there's a base hit with one down. What a bat for Rickard. Great at bat. One of the most famous throw left. 
hit right is Ricky Henderson. Yep. When he was around, there weren't very many of them. Who was the other Oriole? Carl Warwick, who played nine games for the 1965 Orioles. So he was a teammate of Jim Palmer's. As we see there, a really good piece of hitting there. Great at bat to battle back. Got a fastball on the outer half, stays right on it and able to drive it through the hole in between uh, first and second. Just get on base, just get somebody out there, try to get this line moving and see if we can see if they can push this run across. There have been 30 pitchers in the Orioles organization that have thrown left and batted right. And Ricker takes off and he got a huge jump. Throw to second base is knocked down by the shortstop Adams. Oh, the winning run is out there at second base with one down. Three stolen bases for the Orioles today. We get a look here at, at Rickers' jump. Stays low, drives hard right out of the chute. Gets a great jump. Nice head first slide. Puts himself in scoring position. I love the fact that he didn't wait around. He goes early in the count to give Ryan Flaherty a good chance where he's not behind in the count before he gets to second base. 1-0 count. Ryan looking for something to drive and win this game here. And he's ahead in the count, 1-0. Good off-speed pitch. You start talking about the left field position, though. You, you start looking at what guys bring to the table. And this is what you see right here from Rickard already. A single, put himself in scoring position right away. Uh, it's a valuable asset. It's something that I know that that coaching staff has taken into serious consideration. Throw behind him, and he gets back in. And again, the ball dropped by Adams. Well, now you're a veteran, Brian. You got one under your belt here in the booth. Boy, I sure didn't feel like a veteran when I played one big league game, so I don't feel like a veteran <laughs> here either, trust me. Well, this but is it's a, been fun. Thanks for making well, me feel comfortable. It's I appreciate it. It's been especially enjoyable for me because I've known you since the first day you showed up at big league camp over there in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, known you for a long time. You know the family. Uh, you and Allie are buddies. <laughs> yeah. There are, uh, this has been a great organization for myself and my family, and I appreciate everybody that's been a part of it. There's a bouncer foul, and you'll be back on Masson in May, and uh, I heard a rumor that maybe some radio in your future, so. Well, they say I have the face for it, so that, that seems to be where they try to, they were trying to push me that way, I think. Well, Mike Bordick is on radio today, working with Joe down the hall, and I just thought now there's it, a face for radio. It was unnecessary for Mike Bordick to steal my hairspray again. <laughs> So Flaherty's going to 1-2 count here. He's still battling, fighting off some tough pitches, looking for one mistake. Outside, 2-2. Two and two. Flaherty came in 12 for 30 in the spring. That's 400. He's 0 for 1 in this game. Another good take. Another good take. I'll tell you what, Scott Coolball is having a great spring <laughs> because this is what he has been preaching since day one, and you can see it to a man top to bottom. Be patient, swing at hitter's pitches. And that's the key. It's not, it's not looking to walk. It's looking to hit and being willing to take your walk. There's a big difference, and I think that's what you're seeing here. And he got him. Came off speed. That was a nasty sequence right there by Sappington. Finishes him off right here with a hard split. Diving down in the zone. Flaherty had worked the count back to 3-2. You're hoping you get that fastball, and it comes out looking like one, but it doesn't react like one. And Ryan goes down swinging for two outs here in the bottom of the ninth. Brings up what might be the hottest hitter for the Orioles, well, or at this, least power-wise. This is setting the stage. Here's your leading RBI man in the spring, and he has a chance to win the game and walk it off. Christian Walker with 14 spring RBIs. Manny Machado has 10. Mark Trumbo now has 10. Off speed. So he's looking fastball, doesn't get it, and way out in front. You can see the stuff that produced 71 strikeouts in 68 innings out there from Sappington. Good, hard breaking ball. 94 and 95 with the velocity.
Didn't mean to swing and the ball hit the bat, so he's down in the count 0 2. Christian Walker, like Steve Pierce before him, out of the University of South Carolina. A lot of game cops have come through the yeah. Orioles system here recently. Steve Pierce as well as Steve Tollison. And he got it. So Walker a chance to drive in the winning run goes down on strikes and the Orioles have played to their fourth tie of the year. Well, Brian, it's been great. And uh, best of luck along the way. And uh, anytime you need some info, call Palmer. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Well, we hope you enjoy us again on Friday for more O's action from spring training. The birds will welcome the Yankees to Ed Smith Stadium. Our coverage on Masson will begin at 1 o'clock. And now for Brian Roberts, Jim Hunter saying so long from Sarasota on behalf of our hardworking crew. For our final score, the Orioles 8 and the Rays 8. Today's telecast has been a massive presentation. So the Orioles uh, get a grand slam from Alvarez, a two-run shot from Trumbo, but we end in an 8-8-5. Have a great night, everybody.